Vincent and Butch have like a rivalry, you know? So in the in the strip club bar, when uh, Vincent is standing at the bar after Jules walks away, and then Butch comes up and orders a pack of cigarettes, they have this like standoff with one another, and <clears throat> Vincent says, Vincent calls him a word. He calls him Palooka. Yeah, the Palooka. Yeah. And then Butch is like, "What'd you say?" And he goes, "I think you heard me, Punchy." So Palooka is a derogatory term of box towards boxers. It's like a very old term, but it's it's spoken in a derogative. Uh, and then punchy is also another derogatory term to call a, po- a boxer as well as someone who's like been punched up too much and they're getting dim-witted because they've been hit so many times. So Palooka also means someone who throws fights or is a bad fighter. Yeah, so it's, Palooka means a bad fighter as well. That's what he's referring to. So he insults Butch multiple times. And when I was a kid, I had no idea what that word meant. I was like, what did he just say? But that's what he say. He says Palooka. And so he's insulting Butch the whole time. That's the reason why Vincent's car got keyed, I That's think. what I believe, too. Because when he goes to to his drug dealer, to Lance, and he's like, man, I had my car in storage for three days. For three for three years. It's been out for five days. Some fucker keyed my car. Like, what kind of, what kind of spy, spineless scumbag does that? It was definitely Butch keying his car after he insulted him. Definitely. Because yeah. it happened a couple of days ago. He was at the bar a couple of days ago delivering the briefcase. Had that altercation. Butch probably saw his car and keyed it. So it's, I guarantee Butch is the one who keyed his car. You know what they call a quarter pounder with cheese in Europe? Royale with cheese. Hello, movie friends. Welcome back to the show. We are very excited to get into one of the biggest films of all time in American cinema's history. A film that redefined the medium and the genre, created its own style of filmmaking. Tarantino's Pulp Fiction, and we watched this a lot when we were kids. Our brother showed it to us, and I remember being like a little kid watching this and knowing that it was like different from other movies, you know what I mean? And that I shouldn't be watching it. Yeah, but also that was, it was, it felt different. Because this movie defined a decade. In 1994 was a ridiculous year for film. I mean, we had films like Shawshank Redemption, as well as, what else? Uh, so Forrest many. Gump, <laughs> <laughs> The Lion King, an, an iconic year in cinema history. But Pulp Fiction not only does it define the year of 1994, the decade of filmmaking in the 1990s is probably the most memorable and recognizable from that entire decade and most well-liked. And Tarantino had a, a breakout hit with Reservoir Dogs, but it wasn't like a, a huge sensation. Not Everybody didn't see it. It wasn't until it really hit D- DVDs and VHS sales and rentals and it, it grew a big following because that movie, it grossed a, a very modest box office in America, although it was critically acclaimed. But Pulp Fiction, it put Quentin Tarantino on the pedestal of directors in America. It made him a superstar. It made him like a rock star because very few directors have ever had like this like this status that Tarantino had after Pulp Fiction of just being as famous as any celebrity. And um, only filmmakers who had been very established, like Spielberg, like Scorsese, like Spike Lee, were like A-list celebrity f- like filmmakers. But Tarantino burst onto the scene in such a big way in 94 and the crime genre had been in its ups and downs in the 80s, and he revitalized and put new life into it and injected and infused so much of his own uh, charisma and talent as a writer into the storytelling. And he helped redefine the genre of crime, and he also helped bring about a new style of storytelling that hadn't been used too much in America. And this is like the juxtaposition of various storylines that are connected but told in different ways and bouncing around timelines. And it really caught uh, American audiences off guard in a big way. Obviously, Reservoir Dogs did that. But like I said, the everybody saw Pulp Fiction. This movie made $200 million in 1994. Adjust that for inflation, that's close to half a billion. That's a lot of money. So a lot of people saw this film in theaters. And ever since then, Tarantino, his name has been synonymous with just great cinema and incredible filmmaking. And his name is as important to marketing a film as the title and the story itself. He's like that big of a director. His name kind of precedes the whatever content he's making, whatever movie or show is coming out, which is really a kind of a, an elite level of filmmaker. On IMDb, Pulp Fiction is number eight on the user rating list all time. Ironically, in 1994, Shawshank Redemption came out. Also, that is number one, we know. Wow. So two movies in the top ten from that same it's year. It's a great draft class. I know, right? <laughs> It has a rating of 8.9 with over 2 million ratings. And we obviously see new movies come out the last few years. They like are skyrocketing to like in the 8s. But let's see if they stand the test of time like a movie 
as incredible as Pulp Fiction with its 8.9 over 2 million reviews, which is crazy. Rotten Tomatoes, it is a 92% critic score and also a 96% audience score. There is a giant spider on the wall, Anthony. Do you see that thing? Where? Right um, there, right there. Hold on, let me, go, my let, me go, on. let me go take this guy out real quick. Whoa, he's a red one. And James has returned from his uh, murder of the spider, the Woo! innocent spider that was I, mining hey, his I own business. I saved your life, Anthony. Although that it was the size of a quarter, and it was bigger than a quarter. It was pretty big. Yeah. Anyways, let's get back to Pulp Fiction. But uh, there's a letterbox. Its rating is a uh, 4.3, which if wow. you add up to out of 10, that's only an 8.6. So letterbox isn't as kind to uh, this film, and I think many other classic films as IMDb is. Movies made before 2012, letterbox yeah. does not like. On yeah. Metacritic, it is a 94. And on a budget of eight million dollars, it grossed two hundred thirteen million at the global box office, which is probably more than half a billion if you adjust it for inflation. Yeah. It's probably like seven, eight hundred million dollars. Massive hit, and it's probably made ten times that since, just based off rentals, VOD sales, merchandise, everything like that. It's probably a wildly profitable film. Not counting that box office. And he also won the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival. This played in competition at Cannes, and he won the Palme d'Or and the Best Director Award. Uh, his last film, his, his he's only had two films play at Cannes. This one was in competition, and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was just playing just for, for show there. Uh, a couple just of, for shits. Just for, yeah, they do they do that at Cannes. Just like they'll have sh- films play there that aren't competing, but, you know, they're new releases from famous directors that, you know, it helps get people to go there. So, I mean... If Tarantino has a new film out, like why not play it there? So to win that award uh, is a big deal. Uh, Park Chan Wook just won the award. You know, a, a movie like it's it's interesting to see what can win Best Director. And uh, like uh, I remember Nicholas Winding Refn won Best Director for Drive at at Con. Uh, the uh, it didn't win the Palm d'Or, the Tree of Life did, but he won Director over Terrence Malick. And the Cannes Film Festival obviously doesn't include everyone, but still. It's an extremely prestigious award, and to win it on your second film in such a big way, and then to follow it up with a, a few Oscar nominations, it's just a, a, a terrific second feature for Tarantino. Uh, it really showcased that he had it. it. He was not just a one-hit wonder. And a lot of filmmakers, oftentimes their first film can be one of their best, if not their best one. And I say Pulp Fiction, if you look at his filmography, it doesn't have the same quality of filmmaking and production that obviously his later films have. And he wasn't really using all of his full utility belt of trademarks that he's known for nowadays. But that's because of budget restraints. This is only made with an $8 million budget, if I'm if I'm correct. And half of that went to the cast. And so a, a budget like this wouldn't allow for him to use those techniques. And also, I'm sure he was still finding his voice. A lot of trademarks that we've come to know from Tarantino, and these aren't included in every movie, but... They've become synonymous with his name is obviously the very fast zoom ins and zoom outs. He loves to do a lot of overhead tracking shots uh, for long takes. You see plenty of those in his latter films. And he loves to use Ennio Morricone scores, whether they are made for the film like The Hateful Eight or he just draws from old Morricone music that he's made from films from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, all over his entire career. So Morricone music has become very synonymous with, with films made by Tarantino. And then also explosive blood. I mean, in Kill Bill, obviously, he's harkening back to those old action films where the blood just sprays. But even like Django Unchained, the blood's crazy. And then you even have that great finale in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So the, the giant explosive blood power techniques uh, are synonymous with his filmmaking nowadays. Although you do get Marvin's head explode, but that's because like he took a, a gunshot to the head with a massive firearm. So I think that was like not really like that kind of style of blood that he's using now. And these are things that we've come to know and love and expect from a Tarantino fil- film, but you're not seeing him in this film. I think he's kind of learning still as a director. Obviously, he's a great director at this point, but still developing his craft, understanding how to make a film and trying, I think, poking around, seeing what he can do, experimenting. And the more you do it, the better you get, the more you're free on the next film to really try things out. So this is an important step for him. But I would say it's not his best directed film. But its impact on cinema is unparalleled to any other movie he's made. Now, I want to bring up two things before we get more into this. First of all, there's going to be some vulgarity in this episode. There are over 250 uses of the F word, lots of B words. So we're going to be, you know, bringing stuff up and some some 
f bombs might fly. So that's a explicit warning for this episode. There will be some cussing for sure, and we're gonna be like saying lines from the movie. Yeah, so we're gonna be gonna quoting be... it. So there's gonna be some cusses in this episode, just in case. I just want to warn y'all, even though we don't normally let too many out, but just a heads up. It's a vulgar film. We're gonna talk about the vulgarity for sure, and also we're gonna do a movie poster giveaway contest in this episode. All you have to do to enter is like this video and leave a comment on YouTube on our Pulp Fiction episode. That will enter you into this contest. In one week, we will select a winner to get a free movie poster, movie of your choice from our sponsors, movieposters.com. Again, all you have to do is like this video on YouTube and comment on it on YouTube as well. And I love everything about this film, Pulp Fiction. It's always been in my top 10 ever since I saw it. Same thing with like Goodfellas and The Matrix. As soon as I saw those movies, like top 10, and they haven't left, but they kind of get rearranged here and there. And I haven't seen Pulp Fiction in, I want to say, a couple of years. And then we put it on last the other day to, you know, freshen up for this episode. And I was so excited because I think since we started the podcast, I don't know if I've watched it in its entirety from start to finish. Wow. I think I've seen it pieces here and there. But from putting it on, watching it from opening credits to the end, I don't think I've watched it in like three or three years. And now that we've had the podcast and I watch film a lot more a lot differently, a lot more analytically. You're wicked smart now. Especially when I'm watching a movie for the 36th time like this. I'm seeing so many new things from this Pulp Fiction film from Quentin Tarantino. So many things that I took for granted on my previous viewings that I adore and didn't realize I liked so much. I mean, just starting with the opening title sequence with the great surfer rock and roll guitar solo riff songs with the opening credits with the title cards but the pulp fiction logo just slowly going backwards and getting distant and smaller and smaller little things like that i just absolutely love and you never appreciate it until you watch so many movies without stuff like that without this flavor of of great cinema of the past that tarantino still puts in his movies today so this movie it just gave me even more of an appreciation of how much i love it and you know another viewing that i've always uh, viewing it mostly as wanting to be entertained, but now from an analytical lens of like, what are the reasoning behind his decisions he's making for this scene here, or that scene there, or the dialogue here, and really thinking about every decision he made as a filmmaker when watching it. Well, that's a good point that you bring up. And he he, he had it as a f early director of translating the theme of a scene and what's happening in a scene through the camera work. And I mean, a really quick example on the first scene is the diner conversation between Honey Bunny and Pumpkin. And he shoots it from a pretty wide lens and about a 45 degree angle from each actor. This is when they're having like shooting the shit conversation about about like the first two minutes or so of the film, I would say. And then he cuts to a medium shot of each actor nearly facing the, the lens of the camera. So he it's almost like like 90 degrees, like right on the right on the actor. It's like you're sitting in the booth. Yeah, and that's when the conversation takes a turn for, oh, let's rob the restaurant. And he understood as a director how the placement of the camera can change the feeling of the scene from moment to moment. That's just a quick thing he did in the first like f few minutes of the movie where he's illustrating um, what's happening emotionally in the camera work. It's a wallet. <laughs> in... The title itself is just really cool, really interesting. This might be, in my opinion, the coolest movie ever made. That's the best way to describe it. Impossibly cool. Suave. It's edgy. It's fresh. It was fresh at the time. No one ever really seen anything like this, especially the nonlinear story structure, which I want to get into in a little bit. But also, you know, the the definition at the beginning of the film of, of pulp, of pulp fiction, and it's two definitions. The first one is a soft, moist, shapeless mass of matter. And the second definition, a magazine or book containing lurid subject matter and being characteristically printed on rough, unfinished paper, which is the perfect description for this movie. Tarantino making his own kind of pulp fiction, his own pulp magazine, which is really fascinating. I think it's just a great parallel to the entire story. Now, where would you rank this in Tarantino's films, both as your personal favorite and then in your favorites list? Then also where you rank it in his filmography, just from an objective filmmaking standpoint. That's a really good question. It's always it's in my top three for both. Uh, for filmmaking, I put it at number three. I would put Inglorious Bastards and Kill Bill above it. One, two, and three for actual filmmaking and directing. And because Kill Bill one, I mean, excellent, it's a really special movie and. He got so creative with that film, on, and it's just masterful directing. But Inglorious Bastards, I think, is his best piece of directing 
as a filmmaker. That's one of the best pieces of filmmaking of the 20th, 21st century. All, yeah, down. also combined with the, the writing of that film, is it's insane. I wish that came out the past few years so that people would talk about it more. Yeah, because Once Upon a Time wasn't well, wasn't very well loved. Mixed, yeah. mixed reviews. It has like a 7.5 rating on IMDb, so it's not that, that beloved of a Tarantino film. Even though Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, he said is his favorite movie and the best movie he's done, which is interesting to hear that, that he thinks that's his best work. He said that on the uh, Howard Stern show. It's really well made. Yeah. Although at the, I mean, at the end of Inglorious, when Brad Pitt says, "I think this might be my masterpiece," I felt like that was Tarantino saying that about the movie. I'm, I'm sure it was. That was a, a decade ago. Yeah. So he was being meta there. But I, I, I do think that's Inglorious Bastards might be the pinnacle of his um, artistic, artistic filmmaking, uh, of his writing, of how to craft a story, and just. The directing of the film but in terms of a favorite pulp fiction i mean it might be my it, i would say it's my favorite tarantino movie it is so special and the it's also his funniest movie it, i always whenever i watch this film i always forget how hysterical it is and what makes it what really sets it apart from the rest of his filmography is ev- there's so many memorable lines in this movie in the script the dialogue is just it's not like there are too many very lengthy monologues, but like there's so many memorable lines. It's so quotable. Like from start to finish, there are so many just small one-liners and bits and quips here and there, references. It's pretty staggering how quotable the movie is. And all of his movies are quotable to a certain extent, but like, I mean, uh, some of his later films, they have a handful of very quotable moments. But this film, you could, if you make a list of your. If everyone makes a list of like their top 10 favorite lines from Pulp Fiction, there's a good chance it will be very varied lists because there are like 80 very good quotes in this film. As opposed to like in Glorious Bastards, it's more like, oh, that bar scene is amazing. Or Christoph Waltz's first scene is insane. In this film, it's like, that line's amazing, that line's amazing. It's, you know what I mean? You can quote every character from yeah. Pulp Fiction. Yeah, exactly. Multiple yeah. times. Mm-hmm. And what's really interesting about Tarantino is he was kind of a different filmmaker from... The 20th century to the 21st century. It seems like Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, and Jackie Brown kind of feel like a different world, and they all could take place in the same world compared to his films in the 21st century, if that makes sense. Like, those three films act like they could be in the same universe. Obviously, Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction are very much connected, and even he's been on record saying that Vincent Vega played by John Travolta, and then his is his brother, Michael Madsen plays his brother in, uh, in Reservoir Dogs. What's, uh, what's his name? Um, Vic Vega. Vic Vega. So Vic Vega and Vincent Vega are brothers in this movie universe, and Jackie Brown feels like it also fits that universe in a lot of different ways. It, it's got that same kind of grounded filmmaking he had in the 90s, so, but then the 21st century is filmmaking evolved so much just making two kick-ass samurai films in the first <laughs> no, to open up the the century and then obviously the historical rewriting that he's been pra- playing around with for a while for this entire century but it's just a different level of filmmaking that he's at but those first three movies feel so connected and feel like part of the same universe if if that makes sense well which I, I really like i think you're absolutely right and it's because they're la movies his, yeah his first three movies he made it there in la so reservoir dogs was actually filmed in our neighborhood highland park and then this film, Pulp Fiction, is shot all over the valley. Looks like a lot of Van Nuys, um, some South L.A. Uh, not quite our neighborhood, but definitely a lot of East L.A. for sure. And then Jackie Brown is all over L.A. as well. And so it's like Paul Thomas Anderson, which it makes more sense for PTA because he grew up here. He grew up in Studio City. And Tarantino grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee. So it's interesting that he chose to make his first three movies set in Los Angeles. And obviously the Jackie Brown novel set in L.A., so he was just following the novel novel storyline but still it's an LA movie and he injects like the LA vibe into the into the film if you've been to LA or if you live in LA or in similar state cities around the state uh, the apartments in LA have a certain look to them they kind of feel like little hotels or motels reservoir like, dogs feels it's yeah. so LA and just like watching butch walk through into his through his apartment complex it's like i I've, I've walked through 50 apartment complexes that like look similar to that it's just a very LA thing and also the streets are very L.A. His style of cinematography, he likes to shoot with or anamorphic lenses. Lots of car driving shots, like in Reservoir Dogs. So and, many in, Pulp in this Fiction. movie. Yeah, he still, he, he loved, and he, he captured that again with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, like uh, capturing people talking in cars. And I really enjoy that. You don't really see that in the Kill Bill movies 
or in obviously in the period pieces. Kill Bill Two, you see some car driving yeah, over yeah. the but, overhead, but not quite like the two the t- two shot with the two yeah. actors in the front seats talking. There's a ton in Pulp yeah, Fiction. That's that's just such a uh, a part of his DNA as a filmmaker. And uh, someone did a super cut of uh, Reservoir Dogs with a shot of Harvey Keitel and Tim Roth, and then Pulp Fiction with the shot of Travolta and and Sam Jackson, and then Once Upon a Time in Hollywood with DiCaprio and Pitt. And the, the camera's on the passenger side door looking at, and they're both in the frame just chit-chatting. And that's so synonymous with his first two films and then with, the, with obviously, the other L.A. movie, Once a Time in Hollywood, kind of going back to his roots of the, the world of L.A., of Los Angeles. And, and just, you know, the streets of L.A. are just a very constant presence in this film. And you can really feel that. And if you live here, you're like, that's such an L.A. movie. You know, I take back what I said about the first three films feeling their own universe. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood feels like it's part of this universe as well now that I think about, especially the car driving, but the style of filmmaking and specifically the music as well because I love, you know, the opening of Pulp Fiction where we're kind of scanning with the radio while we're going through the title cards and then driving in the cars. There are so many sequences of driving in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and then also in Pulp Fiction. And what I love about the ones in Pulp Fiction are they're different kinds. They're, there's some that are actually they're inside of a car that's moving on a street. Jules and Vincent, that's real. You know, they're, they're really driving around L.A. and they have to deal with sirens if they're in the background or if you hear a car alarm. Sometimes you hear some of that in this movie. Even when, like, when the wolf's talking, there's a car alarm going off in the background because they're shooting exteriors in L.A. They don't have a budget to make like a giant outdoor set. They can't so, close down streets. So they, yeah. they have to deal with what they got. And if you're watching and paying attention closely – to that opening driving scene of Jules and Vincent, you can see through the reflections on the other side of the street, the entire car wagon in front of them and the camera on the hood and everything. You can see through the reflections of the glass across the street. So it's really interesting to see that like low-budget guerrilla filmmaking here with such prominent actors, obviously, with Travolta and Sam L here in this scene. It's really incredible. It adds so much authenticity to the film. <laughs> there it is. Not to mention... Take a shot. Tarantino's not afraid to just have fun with shooting as well in terms of these car sequences where we have a few where he just got like a black and white gritty film reel in the background projected. It's just from a movie from like the 1930s or 40s. It's with Butch in the backseat of the taxi with Esmeralda. He doesn't care that it doesn't match the the world that they're, we've been seeing. He just does it because he loves it. He doesn't give a fuck because that's what he <laughs> loves to do. He's like, I'm going to make a background in this car sequence of just black and white reel from a 1940s movie and whatever. That's what I'm going to do. And he does another one with a fake backdrop as well. And what you're talking about is rear projection, which was the way that filmmakers were able to film a, a driving scene without having to actually drive out in, this, in the – a real street because of the wind or noises or what have you. And so they would just film in a studio lot and they'd set up the car inside the room and they'd put a, a big white screen behind the car and on the other side of the screen, they would project the footage that they filmed, basically like POV or follow or from by the back of a car of like several minute long take of street, of a road, what have you, whatever they're driving on. And then the background, obviously back then, blended in better to the eyes of people when they watched it. But nowadays, we're so used to such high-quality filmmaking. When we watch Rear Projection, it looks cheesy. But trust me, in the 40s and 50s, it looked legit, and people were totally sold on it. But nowadays, you can clearly see it's a flat wall or a screen behind them with the projection on it. But Tarantino used it, like you said, because of his love of it. And I also think it adds a great quality to the scene. So in the other scene you're talking about, you're thinking of, is when Vincent is driving to pick up Mia Wallace, and he's high on heroin. The Rear Projection adds a dreamy quality to it. And also the lighting is just terrific. And boom, 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 Exactly. Boom, boom, boom. And it kind of adds this, like, you kind of are feeling like Vincent. And, and Travolta plays a great high person, especially on heroin. And it adds this, this hazy feel to the scene, and it works perfectly. And then with the Esmeralda Villalobos scene, it feels like it's a, a romantic film noir from the 40s. You know what I mean? And that's, I think that's kind of what he was going for. It kind of feels like on the waterfront, there's a couple of scenes in cars, and you have the boxer, obviously, in the back seat, just like on the waterfront. And so I think he's harkening back to those old film noirs, old romantic films of the rear projection. And he knows it doesn't look perfect. He knows that's clearly visible. The audience is going to tell. But it's about creating a feeling for the scene, and I think he understands that's more important. He does it so much in this film 
He does not kill Bill too. Those old filmmaking techniques, not the uh, rear projection. I'm just talking about filmmaking. So those old filmmaking techniques, he does it so much in this film throughout the rest of the production, whether it's blocking in a scene, like think of which with Fabian in the hotel room. That feels the way he shot it. It feels like a movie from the 1940s. Even the lighting, especially like with Jules and Vincent in the hotel, in the apartment, it's, it's very like harsh lighting. It looks like they just threw a light right there. It's not flattering really, but he's just like, I like this look. We're on a budget at the same time. It works because the, the filmmaking pre- the techniques of this movie, they're not shockingly incredible. They're very simple, but used really effectively, which is one of the great strengths of the film because he's he's got a deck of hands. He's got all these cards. They're not the best cards you can work with because of the budget constraints because after you're paying all the actors and everything, you got, what, $3 million maybe to do this entire movie, not to mention building like that huge set of Jackrabbit Slims, which, which they had to really recreate. I think that was the most expensive part of the production yes. for just one cost outside of the actor's salaries. And everyone was making $20,000 a week, every single actor. It's actually rare that they all were paid the same amount. So even though Bruce Willis only worked 18 days, he still got paid the $20,000. I think he got paid more than everybody else, maybe. They but all got back end. They all got different back end percentages. But they all made $20,000 a week for filming purposes. But I think Bruce only worked 18 days. Poor actors. <laughs> <laughs> but you can tell that it, Jack Rabbit Slim was obviously where a bunch of the budget went to. And the rest of that, I think Tarantino's just playing his cards so well. We don't have to woo the audience with production, with these incredible shots, the cinematography. It's gr- it's really good. I think the drug sequences of shooting up, those are probably the most impressive and exquisite, probably. Like, there's close-up shots of the heroin. Great Anytime edit- there's a close-up of this movie. Too, yeah. But I would say that the production's very simple, but used so efficiently and so well. But it's really the story... The characters, the dialogue, the scenarios, the structure of the film, that's what really transcends it to one of the most legendary films and most favorite films of, of people of all time. And what Tarantino is, what allows him to make a film like this on such a small budget because the film feels so large and so big and important. But what he's always done as a writer and filmmaker, his, his scenes are long. He often has just very long scenes that go on for several months maybe a dozen minutes at least, sometimes even longer. You know, I mean, how many how many minutes of the film is set in that diner? How many minutes are just Jules and Vincent getting to the apartment? Yeah, <laughs> how, many, how many, like the Jackrabbit Slim set, obviously very expensive, but they must have filmed there for two weeks at least. Feels like it's about 12 minutes in that movie, maybe, that, maybe, that scene. Maybe longer. And so he understands that if I build this set, it's going to cost a lot of money, but a bulk of the film is going to be filmed there. So, I mean, it's worth it to build that set. And he understands that he can save a lot of money if I film half of this movie in a diner, <laughs> like, <laughs> come on, or in like a pawn shop. So uh, he uh, he can make these this film and get these huge stars and afford to do it on such a tiny, minuscule budget that uh, this studio is the only studio that would give it to him because he was still so inexperienced and very unknown as a director. He could only get this much, and he somehow miraculously convinced some of the most famous stars and talented actors working to be in the film obviously because of how good the dialogue and, and the scenes were and how great the, the script was. But it's really impressive that he was able to pull it off. And I think it, he, he's what makes him a great writer is he can stretch a scene out longer and better than anyone else can, honestly. I mean, think about any of his more recent films. Like, the scenes are so long. And the longer a scene is, if it's good, the more memorable it is. Because it's not like you're watching 40 scenes whipping by you. You know, and Goodfellas, we love Goodfellas, but there's like 120 scenes of Goodfellas. It's insane how Scorsese pulled that movie off with how many locations, how many sets, how many how many wardrobe changes, what have you. It's so massive in scope of the production, and it's insane that he even wrapped his head around it. And Tarantino is kind of the opposite, where he has very few sets and very few actual scenes. And that's a really great point. And speaking of scenes, since there's so few in the way he made this film was structurally non-linear. We all know this. This is the big movie to do this and change cinema forever. And everyone has been trying to kind of not copy, but kind of get in the same ballpark of what he did with Pulp Fiction. I mean, The Usual Suspects, Memento, those are movies that just came out a few years after Pulp Fiction that are trying to capture and effectively capture what Tarantino did with the non-linear story structure. And there are so many pros to doing this with your film if you do it correctly, you know, 
keeping your audience on their toes. They don't know what's coming next. The emotional attachment gets even stronger for characters that they see and love and then find out, you know, they're they're dying in one scene, but then the movie ends with them walking off kind of into the sunset with Vincent Vega, sort of. You know, you love that character. He gets killed by Butch, but then the end of the movie, he's walking out of the diner. He's like, yeah. I guess he's okay. He's still the hero? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is he? And then who Happy the hero ending? is? <laughs> the nonlinear story structure is... The greatest strength to this film outside of the characters, because it would not be the same movie. And I actually took a little bit of time to write this, the film out in chronological order, as well as a brief summary of the way that Tarantino did it. And I think it'd be really fun to compare them. I would love to hear it, but I just want to mention first about the nonlinear is he was the probably the big, this was probably the big movie in America to do it, but uh, Kobayashi in Japan did it with Harakiri in the, in the 50s. That film is told... Uh, non-linearly from a person telling a series of stories to a uh, leader of a samurai clan. And it, you know the movie Hero, Jet Li, where yeah. he, every time he tells a story, he gets closer to the emperor and until he gets close enough to... You know, I don't want to spoil the twist, but you know, you know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like that where the character is telling the series of stories from the past to the leader and the entire clan of samurai. Uh, and it's very, obviously... Prob- it was probably the biggest international film to ever do that and clearly uh, tarantino being a lover of foreign film and asian film in particular i'm sure drew influence from that great point now there are really seven main narrative sequences told in pulp fiction and this is the way that tarantino tells it i'll go into more detail in the chronological version but basically we have the prologue at the diner which is also the which leads into the prelude of vincent vega and marcel mrs wallace mia wallace uh, marcellus wallace's wife and then we have Vincent Vega and Marcel- Marcellus Wallace's wife sequence. Then we have the prelude to the gold watch, which is the flashback to the present. Then we have the gold watch. Then we have the Bonnie situation. And then we have the epilogue in the diner after the Bonnie situation to conclude the Bonnie situation. So really we have so Vincent Vega and Marcellus Wallace's wife, the gold watch, and the Bonnie situation. So then if you tell it in chronological order... This movie would technically start with Butch and Captain Coons in the story and the golden watch, which he got from his father. And I know you, what you're thinking. It's a flashback. So is that really considered like chronologically in order? If you put it first, you have to because yeah. the flashback means you're telling something nonlinearly. And I saw like a couple people make timelines and they don't have this first. I'm like, listen, How do you not have it first. You have to have it first because a flashback means it's nonlinear. So if it's a flat, it can't be a flashback because it exists. So it has to be the first scene of the movie. I have one question for them. Is Butch a character in the film? (laughs) Then he's involved and it's part of his chronology. So chronological order of Pulp Fiction, it starts with Butch and Captain Coons getting the gold watch. And then it goes to Jules and Vincent driving the foot massages, the big kahuna burger, the briefcase, the murders of Brett and Flock of Seagulls. <laughs> Flock of Seagulls. Divine Intervention, which which basically that's the prelude to Vincent Vega and Marsalis Wallace's wife. And then we would have the Bonnie situation. This is where they're in the car with the briefcase. Vincent shoots well, Marvin. Yeah, in the- yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me- yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Then we have the Bonnie situation. This is where Vincent, Jules, and Marvin are in the car. Vincent shoots Marvin in the face. And then we have the scenario at Jimmy's house, played by Tarantino. And then Vincent, I mean, then we have the wolf, played by Harvey Keitel. That entire scenario where they fix up the car, they put the body in the trunk, get cleaned up, get on the dork yell fits, and then move on to Joe's monster toe would be the next sequence, obviously. Then after Joe's monster toe, the next scene would be the entire diner scene of Jules and Vincent in their booth, as well as what was the prologue in the original film order, is the, also included with Pumpkin and Honey Bunny, going through their entire conversations, going through the holdup in the diner, which now would be the epilogue of the original chronology of the film. So the entire diner sequence takes place and is over. And then Vincent and Jules leave after Pumpkin and Honey Bunny leave with all the wallets, but they have the briefcase. And then what happens next is... Butch has his conversation with Marcellus Wallace. Now, Marcellus Wallace in this conversation is paying Butch to throw the fight that he's going to get in later. So he accepts the money. And then who comes in through the door? 
Jules and Vincent show up with the briefcase in those dorky outfits. Remember, this happens differently in the story in the original chronology. So this is where they show up. And then remember, this is also where Jules retires. We don't see it happen, but this is where he retires from crime. We don't really see what happens to him chronologically after this point in time, but we see what happens to Vincent, obviously. Next, we have the prelude to the gold watch, which is Butch waking up from that flashback from the original chronology of the film of his dream or the flashback of getting the watch from Captain Coon. So he wakes up in the gold robes, ooh, ooh, about to go and get into that fight. And that is the fight that he is supposed to throw in the fifth round, but ends up winning killing the boxer named Floyd, jumping into the taxi as Meralda Villalobos, and then taking off to the hotel with Fabian. He sleeps overnight if with Fabian in the hotel. Wakes up, then we have... Oh, you know, that night we also have, the same night that that happens, Vincent Vega and Mia Wallace go to Jack Rabbit Slims. She overdoses. He saves her life by bringing her to Lance's house, his drug dealer, we have the adrenaline shot sequence, then takes her home. So that all happens the same night. I gotta say, I don't agree oh, with no, that. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. The dates sorry, before sorry, the sorry. fight. So the the date, the days before the fight, I'm yeah, sorry. The, I got that the mixed night up. before. So we have the briefcase, and then Vincent shows up with Jules with the briefcase. Butch leaves, and then they have the date. Then the next night is... Yeah, date OD. Date OD. Then the next adrenaline night shot. is the yeah. boxing match. I'm sorry about that. My fault. Thanks for Thanks for correcting me. So we have Butch waking up. And throws the fight, jumps out the ta- into the taxi. Does, doesn't doesn't throw the fight. I mean, doesn't throw the fight. All right. <laughs> and then, so we got that worked out. Wakes up with Fabian. And then we have just the conclusion of the gold watch sequence where he goes back to get his watch on the kangaroo at his apartment. Kills Vincent Vega, who is taking a shit in the bathroom. <laughs> who you can assume... Would have survived if Jules didn't quit the game and didn't have that divine intervention earlier in his life uh, the two days before. He wouldn't have been alone. And then we have the entire sequence of Butch and Marcellus, their fight, their car accident, being captured, the rape, the murder of uh, Maynard, and then the eventual death of Zed, who I, that's even though we don't see it off on screen, we know it's going to happen. It's going to be terrible for him, which he deserves. And then Butch and Fabian drive away on the chopper. Different movie. That's the movie. Very different movie. And you can tell that Tarantino understood that I need to get the pawn shop in as soon as possible because that's the first big sequence that you see from any of the stories. And the pawn shop concludes the first like real conclusion that we see. I and, think- and of course, real quick, chronological nonlinear storytelling. He did in Reservoir Dogs, but yeah. that wasn't like the big hit like Pulp Fiction was. If you're going back in time, it was a hit critically. But it wasn't like a two hundred thirteen million dollars box office. That's film. what I'm, yeah, that's what I said earlier. Like it only made I think seven million dollars box office. I'm I think like when you look back on it now, you're like yeah, but wasn't Reservoir Dogs? I, we meant I meant like the big nonlinear yeah, storytelling. The, yeah, film. in terms of having like a huge effect on cinema. audiences and cinema. And then people saw Reservoir yeah. Dogs probably after this. And, but I think I think Tarantino really understood. Like I, if I get the climax of the Marcellus Butch storyline in as soon as possible. It'll keep the movie. It'll keep the movie very engaging and shocking because it's a shocking sequence. So he threw that in halfway, in, or more earlier than halfway into the film, because that sequence is over. And then you're like, we got a lot of movie left. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. That's a movie on its own, and it's such a crazy climax and ending. And then you're like, oh, we have two more climaxes and endings coming after this. It's pretty insane. But I- I'm glad you brought up uh, real quick. And the only way, to, there's really no way to talk about this film without just like bouncing around. We have because that's yeah. the way the movie is. Yeah, fuck so, it. So it makes sense. Fuck but, it. Fuck it. <laughs> but you brought up, <laughs> you brought up Vincent uh, taking a shit, and then that's what gets him killed because he comes out, pop tart machine goes off, and Bush uh, kills him with like a hundred bullets in two seconds. That that uh, mini gun, that I don't know what it's called. Uzi. But, yeah, that Uzi. It fires nine hundred rounds a minute. Damn, is what I read. So it, he got hit with a lot of bullets just in that second and a half. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Those goddamn pop tarts. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, there are three unanswered questions in this movie, and I saw some stuff online of people being unhappy about stuff. But let's—I just want to get there's into a lot it. of unhappy people out there. Take it out on movies. <laughs> they take it out on us on film yeah. Twitter. Why didn't Vincent hear Butch going through the kitchen? He's making a lot of noise. This movie. He's making to- He's using the toaster oven. He's unwrapping pop tarts. It's pretty loud. He's making a lot of noise. And Vincent is 15 feet away. 
It's probably a very thin door. Two how, feet away. <laughs> how does he not hear that? I would say, first of all, it's a movie. Second of all, he's probably higher on heroin. He's probably buzzed on heroin. And, you know, maybe he's just not even paying attention. Maybe he didn't even notice it. Because, like, if you're, I've never been high on heroin, but, like, I'm sure your senses are all fucked up. You know well, what I mean? Travolta, he's never obviously done the drug, but Tarantino had him talk to a recovered heroin addict that was a friend of his about the role and about what it's like to be on heroin. And the addict described to him that it's... It's the, it's like the equivalent. You'll you'll kind of have a baseline, sort of, of what it feels like if you get wasted off tequila and lay down in a hot pool, a hot tub, a hot, yeah, a hot tub or a hot a hot pool of water. Uh -huh. So Travolta did that. You got just blasted off tequila. So if you're on heroin, obviously, if you're blasted on tequila, you still probably wouldn't hear what's going on. You'd yeah. be just out of it, man. You would be just on a different stratosphere. And obviously, that's shown with the drug sequence when he's driving. He's just like, boom, 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 yeah. boom, boom, boom. So that's a great point that he's probably blasted. And he's not just a drug user. He's an addict. He's a, he's constantly doing heroin. He's constantly Love high. Good heroin, too. And, the and, the $500 yeah. heroin. And Travolta plays being high so well. It's very subtle. But like the way, like in the milkshake sequence and the way he's talking at the diner, the way he's blinking and... The way he's slurring his words, it's so it's so perfect. The acting is very subtle, but it's there. And then the next question is, why didn't anyone enter that restaurant for what's probably 15 to 20 minutes during um, the robbery? The cafe, the yeah. coffee shop? Yeah, the diner. Again, it's a big diner. You could imagine at least a few people are, going in, are, are about to enter during that period, especially if it's the morning, that morning breakfast rush. It's a movie. Uh, give them the benefit of a doubt. It's a fun scene. It would just, it just, it, it obviously it's more realistic if like a couple of people try to come in, but then you have to deal with like three minutes of like, oh, they're dealing with these people coming in and like, oh, we get to lock the door. Like, it's not necessary. What but, if, what if the uh, the yeah. cockroach guys were coming to spray? <laughs> like, what are we, what are we gonna do yeah, here? This, it's just a, it's, it's just a movie. Let it just go. Let it go. And then the third question is, how did, how did Brad and how did Brad fuck up, fuck Marcellus Wallace? So actually, his name's Brett on the Brett. cast list. Yeah, but I think Sam L says Brad and Brett in the movie. He says both. Yeah. yeah. So um, he, cast list it says Brett. He does, he but Sam but he definitely Sam, says look at the big brain on Brad. Brad. He, but he says Brent at first. Yeah. He does say both words. So Tarantino never actually explains how did they fuck Marcellus Wallace. What exactly went wrong? He's like, I'm sorry that shit got all fucked up. Like, what are they talking about? It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. All that matters is these two guys showed up. It, it's their story. It's their perspective. We're in the perspective of Jules and Vincent. They don't know what's happening. They're just here to collect this case. They know that, that these guys fucked over Marcel Walls. That's all they need to know. I think that Tarantino understood it's irrelevant. It's not necessary exposition, and it doesn't really matter to the plot. And so he just didn't even put it in. There's no need for it. I And I like it. I like it better. There are so many mysteries in this movie where Tarantino, I think he literally just says to the audience, I don't give a fuck if you're confused about something. Why does Marcellus Wallace have a Band-Aid on the back of his head? What's inside the briefcase? I don't care. You don't have to know. And that's part of the allure of the story, part of the greatness, and how it's going to be so timeless and live on forever. Is these little mini mysteries add so much to it. What is in the briefcase? Who the fuck knows? No one knows. Is it drugs? Is it diamonds? Some people say it's the soul of Marcellus Wallace, and that's why he has a Band-Aid on the back of his head. Okay, it doesn't. No, no, no. <laughs> I think that like what motivates Tarantino, and it's very simple. It motivates a lot of filmmakers. It's because it's cool. Yeah, because like it looks awesome to have. It's cool to have the digits be six 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 to open the case. It doesn't have to be a metaphor for the devil, but it's just like you know why? Because it's fucking cool. He's a bad motherfucker. Yeah. Why does he have a shot of the band aid? From what I read, Ving Ving Rhames got cut shaving the back of his head probably yeah and then tarantino i'm sure was like you know what that looks cool yeah let's get a shot of it <laughs> that's all it is and then but it adds like, to the character yeah, he it and, adds yeah and the gold light was a last minute thing from what i read it wasn't really written in the script and then they just came up with it and, and i'm sure tarantino was like that looks cool let's do it that's all it is and, and sometimes it's not you don't have to read too much into a movie it doesn't always have to be metaphorical it doesn't always have to have a uh, uh, allegory or uh, allusion to something or a parallel to whatever Sometimes it's just like, you know what, that's sick. It's, it's, like it's pretty awesome. The Beatles, didn't they write a song about how to like mess with people because people read too yeah. much into their lyrics or yeah. their vote? Or I Am The Walrus. Yeah, yeah, I Am, I am the, the Walrus was just making fun of people who over over thought about their, like, overanalyzed their songs and their lyrics and tried to find metaphors in them. And they were just like, no, we just write stuff because it sounds cool. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> but going back to his use of exposition or lack of exposition, 
that was one of my favorite parts of this movie is he he's not holding your hand and he's only telling you everything you need to know. You don't have to know everything that happened before this. You don't have to know how Butch and Marcellus met. You don't have to know everything about we don't even see Mia and Marcellus Wallace together except for that one shot inside the boxing uh, arena in and the locker side. room. In, uh, no, it's not her. That's her. Is that her? Yeah. I always thought that was a different woman. No, it's Uma Thurman. Are you sure? Yeah. You positive? <laughs> I'm 100% positive. I always, it's I always Mia felt... Wallace while he's on the phone. Yeah, I know. Talking to Jules. It's Mia Wallace with the sunglasses, with the drink, sits down next to him. I always thought it was a different woman. Oh, really? I still think it is a different woman. Google it I'll... right now. Google it right Google now. Google it right now because it doesn't look like her But I, I'll, I'll, I'll say something interesting. Well, I hope it's interesting while you look it up. What's in? What's... What is interesting about this movie is it's the only Tarantino film that has a co-writing credit on it, and so he didn't, he he's the co-write co-credit he's the only credited screenwriter on the film, so he has the sole screenwriting cre- pl- uh, credit. So he wrote the screenplay, directed it. That's why it says written and directed by Tarantino. But his old friend Roger Avery has a stories by co-credit, and so the, what happened was. From what I could figure out was Roger Avery was the guy who worked at the video store with him, and he was also an up-and-coming writer and filmmaker. They would help each other out with their screenplays, give each other notes and tips. They loved watching movies together, and they spent a lot of time just chit-chatting. And so they came up with the, some of these stories together. From what I gathered, Roger Avery came up with a lot of stuff for the Butch Marcellus sequence, and he got the stories by credit. But what happened was Roger Avery wanted a co-writing credit on the as a screenwriter. So he wanted the co co screenwriting credit. Uh, I believe that the studio in Tarantino didn't deem that he had provided enough to get that credit, and so that's why he has the stories by credit, not a screenwriting credit. Very different thing. Oftentimes, a film will just be like story by blah blah blah, but the real credit is like screenwriting or written by. That's that's the big one. And so after that, Tarantino and Roger Avery, from what I read, had a big falling out and never spoke to each other again and never worked together again, obviously. And, I mean, obviously Tarantino has proven himself to be one of, if not the greatest screenwriter of all time. So I'm sure that whatever Roger Avery did, it wasn't that substantial. Yeah, and I, I think I read somewhere that he messed with them where he – he paid the camera guy to cut to black when he was accepting an award for when Tarantino was accepting an award. I can't remember. Something like that. Just really? to mess with them. Wow. Or like a prank. All right. So I, I looked at it again. It looks a lot like her. However, she's got that that swimming cap, the big sunglasses, and she doesn't speak. So that's why it always throws me off. It's Mia Wallace. Yeah, it probably is. Yeah, it's okay. Mia Wallace. Okay. I, always, I don't know why I always thought it was someone else. <laughs> I don't know why either. I when I look at that I, when I see that see, scene I always think it's Uma Thurman. Well, okay, well even though they're husband and wife they never speak together. That's true. They never have a a line of dialogue together. That's true. Mister Wa- Miss and- Marcellus Wallace doesn't like to be fucked by anybody but Mrs. Wallace. <laughs> <laughs> does, does Marcellus Wallace look like a bitch? <laughs> what's What's funny about this movie? It is it can- say what again? <laughs> <laughs> it can be kind of romantic. This movie. I mean, I with, think with Butch and Fabian, it's very cute and it gets it has a lot of good romance in it. And then also with Vince and Mia, it can be quite romantic. They have a real connection. Yeah, they have a real connection, and it's I think it, it's oddly romantic at times. Like, oh, this is actually very cute. But I will say, so you know, they get back to her apartment, and she's like, "Let's music and drinks." That and ain't it, an apartment, bro. That's a nice oh, the house. house. The house. Sorry, sorry. I'm just I'm used to living in LA, and everyone lives in apartments. Everyone's Although we poor. don't. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't mean we're not poor, but <laughs> we just don't live in Hollywood. You got a good, yeah. If you don't live in Hollywood, you're all, you should be you should do all right. Or in the valley. But I will say, so in that scene, they get back, and she goes to put on music and drinks and make drinks, and he's like, "I'm gonna take a piss." That's a little more information than I needed, Vince. But go right ahead, knock yourself out. He goes in the bathroom. He's just pepping, pep talking himself. He's like, "You're not." He's basically saying, "You're not going to sleep with her. It's the boss's wife." It's the test of one's it's, loyalty. Yeah. <laughs> and then she's just enjoying herself in the other room, listening to music and then drinking and then doing drugs. I think that it's a. It's for me. I look at that scene. And it's funny because Vince thinks that she wants to have sex with him, but I look at it as like she's just is having fun and a good time with him. 
and is, isn't intending to have sex with him. Although there's a connection, but he's just a guy. He's like, okay, she wants to sleep with me for sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can That's look at it. That's how I look at it. Yeah, but also there is a connection. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Not only saving her life, but there's a connection that they make at Jackrabbit Slims during that dinner. The awkward science, the uncomfortable silence, the interesting chit-chat. But also, you know, they win the dance contest, which I think meant a lot to her. But then when they walk through the door and they're dancing through the door, she shuts off the alarm. And then they're giggling, and then they have that other uncomfortable silence. And he goes, is that what you call an uncomfortable silence? She says, I don't know what you call that. That is an insinuation that there could be intimacy between the two of them. Yeah, I think so too. But I, uh, If she I, doesn't know D. I think it's fun to look at it just like a guy thinking he's going to get laid. Oh, no, yeah. no she problem. She totally wants me, <laughs> yeah, bro. You know what I mean? <laughs> I rolled her a cigarette. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I bought her a $5 shake. <laughs> $5 milkshake. I deserve no, but... this. <laughs> I am a man. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. <laughs> The fact that guys deserve that because <laughs> they buy a five dollar shake. No, but there's, I think there's definitely a connection. I think there was definitely a possibility of intimacy between Vincent Vega and Mia Wallace if it wasn't for the overdose. I think it was gonna be there, but Vincent Vega, obviously being arrogant about the situation yeah. of being a douche, like oh, of course she's into me, yeah. talking himself out of it, which is like the right thing to do. Besides the hubris in his head yeah. of him being so desired by Mia Wallace. <laughs> It's still there. Absolutely. 100%. There's an attraction. There is an intimate and, connection. And Tarantino was setting it up with the jokes early in the film. It was like, take care of her. Like, take, take her. care of her. <laughs> <laughs> You're taking me, Mr. Marcellus Wallace's wife the out for a date. Boss's wife out? It's not a date. So he, he's, set, he's planting that seed, obviously, in the audience's mind. Also, there's actually quite uh, a bit of deleted footage between Vincent and Mia. There's a bunch of deleted scenes yeah, in this movie. I, I, haven't, I didn't see them, but I read about them. So there's this whole, like conversational subplot about Elvis and, and the Beatles. And so if you've seen True True Romance, it has a lot of Elvis in there. Uh, Christian Slater's character is obsessed with Elvis. Tarantino is obsessed with Elvis. And when he was younger, he was like super, super obsessed with Elvis. He just wrote himself into True Romance. Yeah, exactly. He's, he is Christian Slater's character, yeah. basically. Um, <laughs> like, wa- watching kung fu movies alone in theaters. <laughs> it was like basically a fantasy, I think, of his own life. Of Like, I want this girl to come into my life and we could get onto an adventure, adventure together. It's a great movie. Excellent movie. But he's an Elvis man. And so in the film, in the deleted scenes, Mia Wallace actually comes out with the DV camera recording Vincent and interviews him and asks some questions about himself and then even says, asks, are you an Elvis man or a Beatles fan? And she says, I bet you're an Elvis man. And he says, I am. And she says that I think that every person is either an Elvis person or a Beatles person. And so she could tell that based upon how he dresses. He's got the bolo tie on, clearly like an Elvis guy. And that's why Sam Jackson calls Pumpkin... Ringo. That's because he's alluding to Ringo Starr. So it, it harkens back to the conversation of you're a Beatles fan or you're a. What was it? Elvis, Elvis man. Fan, Elvis man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, what was I talking so, about? <laughs> so that's why I always wonder why he called him Ringo at the end. And it, I've, I've watched this movie 20 times before I got into the Beatles. And then now, knowing in retrospect, it's actually pretty cute. Like That's why he calls him Ringo. And that's why um, they talk about Elvis. Yeah, there's a bunch of deleted scenes. Yeah. There's a Joe's Monster Truck sequence between Joe and Wolf that's deleted completely. And then really, when he's, yeah, and then he's, it doesn't work. Work. I've watched it on YouTube. It, it doesn't. What happens fit. in it? It's just them two sh- talking and shooting the shit about like body parts and like a deal and like exchanging money. Uh-huh. Um, it's it's entertaining, but it definitely doesn't work with the movie as well as there's like a two minute scene of the Wolf and Raquel. Joe's daughter walking to the outskirts of the entire garage area where they meet up with the guys in their volleyball tournament uniforms that they got from Jimmy. Interesting. So Wolf and Raquel have like a two-minute dialogue sequence walking up. Really? But Tarantino just literally cuts to when Wolf and Raquel meet them out front of the garage. That's interesting. I, I, and it doesn't work. I watched it as well. I, f- I Yeah, I feel like that would just be empty time. It slows down because yeah. you, you got to get to the diner. You got to get there. That's the really big part of the movie really going forward, and you got to end it, and you got to just get there quicker. I, read, I get it. I read that uh, Christopher Walken, when he was doing his monologue, uh, if you remember, and we just watched it last night, there's a moment where he pauses. This watch. This watch. And he this pauses watch. for like five seconds, and then he continues talking. What happened was he actually forgot his next line. And so on that pause, he was like, he froze. And then you could tell 
You can, there's a hint that, oh, I got in the line again. <laughs> he remembers it, and then he goes back into the monologue. Works so well, though. Yeah, and I read that they, they kept that taken because it, that beat really works, but there's like a five-second where he's just like, and then he starts the dialogue again. It's because he just completely forgot what he was saying. And speaking of dialogue, Di- Tarantino's dialogue in all of his films, and specifically, you know, Reservoir Dogs, or all of them, actually, but full Fiction, since we're talking about it, It's so effective because it's unique and realistic. No one writes dialogue like Quentin Tarantino, whether it's in Nazi Germany or in Los Angeles in the 1990s, 1980s, whatever. He's incredible at it. And they're just these little stories and anecdotes that are just how people talk in real life. We're not getting BS exposition just to inform the audience about something that's about to happen. I just love how he peppers in these little stories, these little anecdotes that everyday people talk about. And, you know, the most famous ones are probably the Royale with cheese. Vincent just got back from Europe and he's telling Jules about the little differences there in Holland. And, you know, the little differences. You know, they don't, they, you know what they put on, on French fries instead of ketchup in Holland? Mayonnaise. I see him smother in that shit. It's, they it's drown funny. him in that shit. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's unique. It's got the flavor of real life. And he always ties in these little anecdotes full circle. So the Royale with cheese story that he's telling Jules in the car, Jules turns it on Brad and Brent and, and Flock of Seagulls when he's talking to him when he's got control of this great situation, the scenario. He's in charge of the conversation. He's intimidating. But he just throws in that line that he just learned. So he's referencing Vince that we just heard the reference from. And it's great. It's full circle coming with that reference and that anecdote. Another one is the foot massage story, which is really interesting because it takes a while to get full circle there. Jules is telling Vincent about the foot massage, and they have that debate. Yeah, I'm a foot fucking master. Like, about the, the, I don't tickle or nothing. The intimate levels of <laughs> I got my technique down, everything. I don't tickle or nothing. <laughs> about whether or not a foot massage is an intimate relationship. Tarantino clearly inserting himself again. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> is it as intimate as oral sex, oral pleasure, The same that kind of debate that they're having? And why Marcellus threw Tony over the, out of a four-story building because of the supposed and rumored foot massage that he gave Mia Wallace that comes full circle at Jack Rabbit Slims when Vincent Vega brings it up to Mia Wallace. like She's like, think of something to say. I'm going to go powder my nose and blow a huge line of cocaine. You come up with something to say, and he comes up with something controversial but interesting to say, which she is welcomes but obviously shoots down because the only thing that Tony touched of him was her hand when he shook it at her wedding. Shooting down the the rumor of when these goons get together, they're worse than a sewing circle of the rumors they spell. But that takes a, half a film. <laughs> they talk a lot, don't they? They sure they certainly do. <laughs> Great little inside jokes, but it's coming full circle. And then another one is, I would say, I have it right here. I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> You're doing Butch's- great. <laughs> Butch's father's watch and Butch betting on himself after the fix, that leading to the single weirdest day of his life and kind of having to do with the line of his of that gold watch going through his family and his familial ties of the patriarchs of his family going through hell basically to preserve this watch and pass it on and the legacy continuing. That's kind of something that goes full circle from the gold watch story we learned from Coons and now Butch is adding to the legacy of that gold watch with his story it's like pavlov's gun exactly it's like you set it up and then you knock it down yeah (laughs) there's also something i really love about tarantino's writing and it's the specificity that he throws in and he'll like any other writer will just write something mundane but he makes it special with some with uniqueness and so an example of this is butch's watch where was it left in his dad's ass. <laughs> no, the watch <laughs> on not the, the kangaroo. Not, on the little kangaroo. On the kangaroo. On the little kangaroo. <laughs> okay, so Bush's watch was left on a little kangaroo. On the bed st- bedside table. Little on the kang- kangaroo. On the kangaroo. So on the kangaroo. That's what, that's my point. Yeah. Every other so many other every other writer would just be like on the bureau. Or on the table. On the bedside table. You know what I mean? But Tarantino, it's on the kangaroo. It's something very specific. His dad's ass. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say my point? Jeez Louise. <laughs> and he does this all the time. And another one that I really love is in Jane Guan Chain. So when Calvin Candy has control at the dinner table and he's showed his cards and he's he's revealed that he knows what's up. And he tells everyone to put their hands on the on the dining room table. 
he says specifically, do not remove your hands from that turtle shell table, from that turtle shell tabletop. <laughs> it's my, my favorite line in, in Django and Chain. I love it because it's so specific. It's not maple. It's not just the dining room table. Turtle shell tabletop. It, it, that's really the flourishes of the brilliance of Tarantino's writing of these little tiny details. Like anyone else would just say, don't take your hands off the table. But what does Tarantino say? Don't take your hands off that turtle shell tabletop. It's so specific. Same thing with the kangaroo. It's the same kind of idea where he just adds so much detail to like the mundane, the trivial. It's not just on the bedside table. It's on the little kangaroo. And I love that about his writing. And the monologues he writes are terrific and so unique to every character. Whenever any character in his movies are talking, you are listening intently because you cannot wait what they're going to say next. And you're so fascinated by their dialogue. There isn't a single line or word of dialogue in this film in any Tarantino movie that doesn't fit perfectly or blend so well. And obviously editing has a lot to do with that because these scenes are long. I'm sure that there is a ton of dialogue that ended up on the cutting room floor of this movie in addition to so many deleted scenes, but editing plays a huge part of making the dialogue sound so much crisper and the monologues sound great. And we actually have a a kind of a superlative list that we're going to go through. Oh yeah, let's do it. And speaking of monologues, Favorite monologue is on that, and my favorite monologue in Pulp Fiction is probably the Marcellus Wallace monologue that he's giving to Butch inside of his bar, where the shot is the literally- The pride ju- one? Yeah, the pride. In the bar, where but the shot's just on Butch the whole time until we see the back of we see the back of Marcellus Wallace's head, holds up the cash. And this is a, a discussion and a conversation about Marcellus recruiting Butch to throw a fight. Throw, you're going to fall in the fifth round, your ass goes down. Say it. And here's a bunch of cash. And in in a year, you're going to be chilling in Tahiti, thinking Marcellus Wallace was right. But he doesn't just ask him to throw the fight and offer him money like 99% of movies do in these kind of situations. Like, here's the fix. Here's the money. If you do it, you're dead. Marcellus Wallace really taps into the psyche of Butch, really breaking him down, but also treating him like an equal in terms of letting him understand the situation being honest with them. You know, your shot is gone. If you were going to make it, you would have already. Let's be honest here. I'm going to be honest with you. Be real with me. I'll be real with you. It's over. But you have a chance to make some money before you're shot. What do you got left? And you one or two fights left. Let's make some money. You'll be good. You'll be a, you got a little rich. You, you got a little loot. Do something cool when you retire. But you're done. You might as well make some money. But I'm going to be honest with you. I respect you. And that's why I'm being up front. And that's why I'm just... I'm explain this to you, you know, the great metaphors that he gives of of aging in this profession, you know, what does he say? He says, you don't age like- There, I got, I got. You see, this profession is filled to the brim with unrealistic motherfuckers. Motherfuckers who thought their ass would age like wine. If you mean it turns to vinegar, it does. If you mean it gets better with age, it don't. So he's telling, he's telling Butch something that he's probably been in denial about for years. He's offering him money and helping him out, really. It's a deal. And it's just the monologue is so unique and specific to Tarantino. And you don't ever hear it put like this when it's this kind of scenario. That's a great pick because I feel like it would be an unpopular pick. And it's just really brilliant the way he directed it by not even showing Marcellus Wallace's face. Because the first time you see his face is when he embraces Vincent. And even that's from afar. It show- We it really adds- don't see his face until, I would say, in the... The donuts. Act- <laughs> no, no, before that, it's when... um. After the boxing match. Well, in the boxing, in the... He turns, he turns... In the locker room, he no, he doesn't turn. He just he, lifts his hand up. He turns a little bit so we see the side of his face. We yeah. don't see his full face, but we see a glimpse of his face for the first time. Yeah. Well, I... No, I... You get a good... You get the full face in, in the uh, in the bar, in the stripper bar. You get you get. It's in the face. distance, though, like yeah. you said. Yeah, but I you get the really, really up-close look during the, the car crash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, when he... Motherfucker. Motherfucker. <laughs> That's a great pick. Well, I'll be damned. And I'm sure Vin Graham's... I mean, obviously, I'm sure maybe it stung a little to get your monologue shown, not showing your face. I don't think he cared at all. It's so artistic. I suppose so, yeah. I suppose so. It makes him even more of a badass villain in Big Marcho, like like the leader in the Kingpin, where the mystery around Marcellus Wallace is massive because of not showing his face for a while. I think that's one of the great strengths of this film. Mia Wallace's first scene, we don't see her face at all. 
She's talking to Vincent through the recording, the device, the uh, oh, yeah, yeah, the, uh, yeah, the yeah, speakerphone. Yeah. We see her lips, but we don't see her face. And her feet. <laughs> yeah, we see her feet. <laughs> we see her feet before we see her face. I don't think there's. I don't think Ving Rhames cared at all. I think I he suppose, probably loves yeah, it. I suppose. It but adds it, to the it, character. It does absolutely work for the film, and it makes Marcellus Wallace feel larger than life and and just more like so a, powerful, more godlike almost. Yeah, because he is the most powerful person in the film by far. And my favorite monologue is the diner scene. But not the pumpkin and honey bunny one, and not the Jules and Vincent one. It's the it's when Jules is talking to Pumpkin, and he's talking about he's describing his transitional period, and he has complete control over the situation. Like, and Tim Roth plays it so well. He has this look of like just stunned fear and just like panic on his face, but he's playing it really well, subtly. But you can see like his stomach's dropped, and he's like, "I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna die," and then Jules. Has complete control of the situation. It's just genius to have like uh, a hold up, and then to have a character hold up the ho- people holding up the restaurant. You know, it's pretty wild. And this is, I think, what got Sam Jackson the Oscar nomination. This entire sequence, where he's just got this incredible, focused, controlled, serious tone. We've seen him uh, showcase a lot of anger and a bit of a temper, but still being in control of situations, but very emotional. And seems to be, in a lot of ways, enjoying his work. But now, he's just super cool. He's calm. He's almost, like, monk-like. And I love Sam Jackson's delivery of this entire monologue. It's really special. It's his best bit of acting, probably, of all time. And it just really seals the deal for Jules' character. And it really is what got him the nomination, in my opinion. So I, I, I pick... My favorite monologue is Jules in, in Pumpkin. I love that monologue, too, because he's flipping his Ezekiel Bible verse on its head and, like, reinterpreting it yeah. on the spot from everything that's happened to him in the last several hours with the divine intervention. And actually, that quote from the Bible, I have it right here. So it's Ezekiel twenty five seventeen. This is what Jules says when he's about to bust a cap in somebody's ass. So he says... The path of the righteous man is beset on all sides by the inequities of the selfish and the tyranny of evil men. Blessed is he who, in the name of charity and goodwill, shepherds the weak through the valley of the darkness. For he is truly his brother's keeper and the finder of lost children. And I will strike down upon thee with great vengeance and furious anger those who attempt to poison and destroy my brothers. And you will know I am the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon you. Now that passage exists but it's a lot different than the actual bible tarantino actually rewrote it for the film and to be more cinematic for a character to speak and actually the first part where he talks about uh and i will strike down upon the that's all been that's a so the direct quote is from ezekiel 25 17 in the bible is will execute great vengeance against them with furious reproof then they will know that i am the lord when i lay my vengeance upon them and tarantino actually invented the first couple lines of that passage for Ezekiel 25, 17 for the film. Feels Bible-y. It definitely does. So it's ba- so he just rewrote the Bible verse to yeah. be more cinematic yeah. and more contemporary for sure with yeah. the dialogue. Yeah. I love it. Interesting. Yeah, it works so well. Want to do another superlative? Absolutely. I love superlatives. Ooh, these are tough to choose too. All right. What's your favorite? Who's your favorite character? Favorite character. This is like such a tough choice. I'm going to go, I think I'm going to go Butch. Nice I point. think Butch has the ultimate redemption in this film, which many characters have redemption in this movie, actually, even though it's a bunch of gangsters and killers. But I think Butch's story is really strong. I, I think the legacy of the Golden Watch is really fascinating. One of my favorite thematic elements of the movie and just how he has to go through hell to keep that legacy of the Gold Watch alive is really it's really terrific because it harkens back to what the fathers before him did to get that Gold Watch to their sons. And I, I love the interactions he has with Fabian. I think the the motel with Fabian is such an underrated sequence. It's got some great dialogue, so so many great romantic elements, and some some really terrific lines by Fabian as well. Like I think the um the line she says where it's 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 to paraphrase something like uh, it's disappointing that what's pleasing to the touch is often different than what's pleasing to the to the I, eyes. Yeah. Or what's pleasing to the eyes is different than what's pleasing to the touch. I think it's really deep and philosophical and really interesting because you know it's based on societal norms if you think about it what attraction is at, at the time in terms of culture it's always changing to like this kind of thing or what's in vogue at the time so i thought that was i think that those sequences are great but i think butch going back to get his kangaroo watch which 
you're gonna die. Chances are you are gonna get killed, going to get this watch. It's just a watch, but it means so much to him. And he's so, he's very arrogant and prideful. He didn't really explain to Fabian how important it was. And he blows up on her. He does apologize to her after throwing the TV and having a tantrum. But it doesn't, reader, ex- it doesn't excuse, but he does understand how he's, how wrong he is for the outburst on her. They're screaming at her in the car. <laughs> one fucking thing. No, one thing. The, the, the watch on the kangaroo bedside table. <laughs> but the fact that. He has to go. He has to go get that watch. And w- what's going to happen to this guy when he goes there? It's so intense. It's exciting. It's thrilling. Just you're, We're stalking through the neighborhood with Butch going up to his apartment. Steady to get cam. This, but it's, he gets in there so easy. Yeah. He's like, this is how you're going to be in a Butch. They keep underestimating you. He kills Vince Vega because obviously Jules isn't there to keep Vince in line from being just a mess up at his job. And then the whole sequence with Vince Vega, I mean with, uh, with uh, Marcellus Wallace, Twice he redeems himself because he redeems himself for for his own for his own pride where he doesn't sell himself short and he goes back on the fix and flips it on his end and makes a profit and a fortune off betting on him to to win the fight, which he does. Because once once everyone knew the fix was in, the odds against him got insurmountable. Skyrocketed. Yeah, so then he just made a huge profit. But then he redeems himself again when he could leave after he breaks through the chair and knocks out the gimp. He could leave Marcellus Wallace. But he decides to put his life on the line to save Marcellus Wallace, which he doesn't have to do, which he could assume Marcellus Wallace is probably going to try to kill him again. But he still does it because it's the right thing to do. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's the best decision it made in the film. And Butch making that decision, there's debate, and I, I did some research online. There's debate, like people said, oh, he just did it to save his own skin, to get off uh, Marcellus Wallace's bad list. Nah. I sub- when I watched the movie, Butch did it because it was the right thing to do because he didn't want to watch someone suffer. And who knows how long Marcellus Wallace would have suffered for and would have been trapped there. Like, God only knows. It could have been years. Like, how long is the gimp in there? And He'd you- probably be the new gimp. Yeah, because you can imagine the gimp started out just as a normal guy who was just captured, same kind of thing, and then just turned into, like, this slave. And you could say the same thing would happen to Marcellus Wallace, who was ironically the most powerful crime boss in LA it, it, it seems so and then just to be possibly re- reduced to being a gimp slave for these two crazy guys it's a really in, in really intriguing story and the way I look at it is that Butch did it because it was the right thing to do and he was it was like the, a sense of honor if he you wanted know? to get off of Marcellus Wallace's list he would have just killed Marcellus Wallace too with the sword yeah exactly so he did it because he he felt like it was like, you know what? I'm a human being. This guy's a human being. I don't want him to suffer. These guys are monsters. I'm just going to take them out. And so I, I think Butch is a great pick for favorite character. Thanks. Also, the, Fabian, there's actually a lot of allusion to him, her being pregnant because she's talking about the pot belly yeah. and saying, like, I think it'd be sexy. And she's, like, measuring her. She's, like, putting her hands on her tummy. And, like, she's, like, expecting, like, a tummy to grow. And then also the next morning she has that giant breakfast. And I read that. A uh, woman who are recently pregnant, they can have large appetites. I guess I'm pregnant. Because <laughs> <laughs> she orders, she says she's gonna order like a dozen things. And, Blueberry pancakes. Yeah, yeah. Blueberry pie. So I think for breakfast. Yeah, he's clearly alluding that she's pregnant in those scenes. It's very cute. Yeah, it's I get that subtle. impression as well. Yeah, absolutely. I picked for my favorite character, Jules. It was definitely, I would say, the hardest role for any of the actors because Sam Jackson has, without a doubt, by far the most dialogue and the most intense monologues. Just so many words to remember. And obviously the cadence and and style of Tarantino dialogue is just very specific. But he nails every scene. He earned that Oscar nomination. And Jules is just a a fascinating character. It would have been cool maybe to get another scene with him, to see him outside of the job, but it's 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 fine. It's perfect already. I think it works better for him because he's a consummate professional at his you job. Might be, yeah, you he's might be. He's a prodigy. Right. Yeah, but I, but yeah, as the wolf would say, spoken like a true prodigy. But he's so well spoken, and he's always so in so such control of himself. But he can command a room and just take complete control, like the Big Kahuna Burger sequence. He walks into that room and he's in charge, and he he goes from being funny and charming and kind of silly. With that conversation with Vincent. The cornerstone of any nutritious breakfast. To hamburgers. Just, to being the most intimidating guy imaginable. And he is terrifying, especially in, if you're in the shoes of any of those three guys. The way he commands a room. 
And then the transition he goes through as a character, believing that a miracle happened, believing that divine intervention, intervention saved his life, going through this transitional period just over a matter of an hour, and then in the diner, those great lines, that great monologue, just an incredible series of sequences for, for Sam Jackson to just chew on, and he does a phenomenal job. It's the best performance in the film, and also, I, I'll, I'll, I again, it's the hardest job by far that anyone had in the cast, pulling that, that character off and pulling off those scenes, and he just did an amazing job. So uh, Jules, I really love. What's interesting about Jules is they didn't have the look down of Jules. Obviously, he's iconic now. Jerry Curl here with the um, with the suits, the mutton chops, the mutton chops. But he didn't have the curls originally. From what I gathered from a couple of interviews, the Jerry Curl wig was a last minute thing, like very last minute, like right before they were filming, and. Jackson and Tarantino didn't feel quite right about Sam Jackson's hair. If you look at press photos of Pulp Fiction, it's the cast photos in character in wardrobe, and Sam Jackson is not wearing a wig. Wasn't he going to wear an afro? So here's here's where it's at. It, he wasn't going to wear anything originally. That's why in the press photos and in the original poster art, he doesn't even have a wig on. It's just his his hair. It's short with the receding hairline. Uh, he was going he was going bald at this time before he started shaving his head. And if you look, just search search online, press photos and early posters, that's his look. And he's he's in character as Jules. He's with the other actors in character. Now, before they started filming his scenes, they didn't feel right about the look. And so Tarantino had some PA run to the nearest place to get some wigs. And they got the Jerry Curl wig. Apparently, from what I read, it was just some cheap, like, random wig. And they got a little wet with some spray and it looked really cool, and then they were like, this is it. Once he put it on, they were like, this is this is the wig. This is the look. And so they started filming with that. But it's really interesting to see how the look of the character, which now is so memorable, and you can't think of it, at Jules, in any other way, it wasn't the original plan. And to be so far as that they, they, were, they did the photo shoots of him in character without the wig, it's crazy to see how last minute that change happened. I always thought that they took those photos like after production. But that makes that would make sense that they're all in wardrobe. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty funny. I, I have an interesting casting story about Sam L. So Tarantino told Samuel Jackson that the role of Jules Winfield was already his. This is before filming, and then Tarantino told him that he would actually have to audition after Paul Calderon, who plays the bartender Paul. My hey, this is between y'all. My name is just Paul. And he had apparently put on a terrific audition that impressed the producers and Tarantino. And this pissed off Samuel L. Jackson. He's like, I can't believe I have to go in and audition after I was told this part's mine. So he, he went to a fast food burger joint, picked up a burger for his audition. And according to one of the producers, this is a quote from Richard Gladstein, who produced, he said, he walked in and just started sipping that shake and biting that burger and looking at all of us. I was scared shitless. I thought that this guy was going to shoot a gun right through my head. His eyes were popping out of his head, and he just stole the part. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so he had been trying to get in a part in Tarantino film after Reservoir Dogs, and he was in, he was actually in True, True Romance. He has a small role in True Romance, but obviously Tarantino didn't make that. Uh, Tony Scott did. So he had met with Tarantino – during the premiere, I believe, of Reservoir Dogs, if I remember the interview correctly, and he went to QT, and he's like, get me a part in your next movie. I want to be in your next movie. And so that's how they first met, and that's why I'm sure they had a few meetings after that, and Tarantino had kept him in mind for that role. I believe he also was looking at him possibly for the role of uh, Tim Roth's superior officer in uh, Reservoir, Reservoir Dogs. Dogs. I believe that Sam Jackson was up for that part as well. If, if I, I might be mistaken. I might be mixing things up, but... The casting of this film was actually pretty tumultuous, especially for the role of Vincent Vega. Now, Vincent Vega was a hot role in Hollywood. Even Daniel Day-Lewis wanted to do the role. He wanted it really badly. Really? And he approached Tarantino and the producers of Pulp Fiction desperate to play the role of Vincent Vega because it's such a, it's a great role. And Tarantino was fighting with the producers constantly because they wanted a bunch of well-known actors, hot actors at the moment, Travolta at that time was in a very big downward trend in his career. He had just done like Look Who's Talking, 
a lot of his movies. Well, look who's talking was a bounce back. That made a lot of money. That was a very popular film. He was cold as ice though before that. Okay, okay. That okay. was his first comeback. All right. But he still was still a kid's it's a movie about a talking baby. He wasn't back yet. Yeah, it's a movie about was, a talking baby. That was a really successful movie. It was successful, but I mean I still don't think he had the like the respect of Hollywood. He was still cold as ice. Yeah. And his movie his filmography was in it was just in retrograde and it, he was just career was over. Yeah, his career was over and Hollywood didn't want him anymore. Hollywood was done with him. But Tarantino wrote this film with him in mind because Tarantino was a big Travolta fan. One of his favorite movies is actually Blowout, starring Travolta. So good. Watch it. Direct, yeah, directed by Brian De Palma. He also loved Saturday Night Fever. So Tarantino loved Travolta, and he knew that Travolta had the star power. And so I, I saw this interview with Tarantino. It was actually pretty recently. I believe it was on Howard Stern. He, there was a, great, a bunch of great sound bites on the Howard Stern interview he was on a couple of years ago. And he told the story about how he went out about town in L.A. with Travolta, and nobody knew who Tarantino was at this time. But he's, And this was when, apparently, according to Hollywood and according to Hollywood producers who told Tarantino Travolta was dead, nobody cared about Travolta, he was done in Hollywood. This is what every producer told him. He went out with Travolta, and he, they were getting mobbed everywhere they went. People were freaking out every time they saw John Travolta. And it didn't matter if they were American or uh, international visitors touring or some tourists in L.A. Everybody freaked out every time they saw John Travolta in public. So Tarantino, he's like, I know people love this guy. I know that this guy still has the star power and people still adore him. People will want to see him in movies. Hollywood doesn't know what it's talking about. These producers don't know what people really want. So that gave him – that. They hanging out with Travolta gave him the confidence to be like, this guy has the star. He has the star power. His career obviously isn't working right now, but he ha he's still a big star. People adore him. And that really got him to just be like, I'm going to stick to my guns. Travolta is my guy. Eventually, after fighting for so long, they finally agreed. I believe they just agreed with a, a smaller budget, got Travolta, and it blew Travolta up. He became one of the biggest stars alive again. And his, 90, his career in the 90s was really huge. And this movie really catapulted him into super, super stardom. What's he do? He gets on base. Gets on base. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like Billy Boone yeah. the A's. <laughs> no, Moneyball. <laughs> Sick reference, bro. Uh, they also, he also approached Michael Madsen, bef I think, before Travolta. And Madsen actually turned it down, and he did Wyatt Earp instead, which was a huge flop and he regretted obviously doing it and they didn't speak for years until Kill Bill 2. Really? Because what I read is that he was doing Wyatt Earp but he didn't turn down Pulp Fiction. The producers wouldn't allot it into his schedule to make Pulp Fiction at the same time as Wyatt Earp. That's what I read. Alright, alright. So I have some more casting info. So after Travolta's deal was closed Bruce Willis landed the role of Butch which was initially promised to Matt Dillon, actually. Well, I think that would have been... He would have been pretty good as that, probably. He could have done a pretty good job, yeah. I guess. Not Bruce, but still yeah. pretty good. And then Winston Wolf was written specifically for Harvey Keitel with Tarantino, once saying, quote, Harvey had been my favorite actor since I was 16 years old. And Tim Roth, another Reservoir Dog star, was Tarantino's only pick, apparently, for Pumpkin, with the role written for him in mind. But I also heard that there were a couple other actors up for it from a different source. Well, actors being up for it is the producers have people in mind, gotcha. but Tarantino has his guys in mind or gals in mind. Like Amanda Plummer, he wrote that role for her as well. Michelle Pfeiffer, Meg Ryan, and Holly Hunter, and Rosanna, Par R Rosanna Arquette were... Or is it Patricia Arquette? Patricia Arquette. Rosanna. Okay, Rosanna She's Arquette. in the film. Yeah. We're all reportedly considered considered for the role of Mia Wallace, the sexy drug addicted wife of the burly crime boss Marcellus Wallace. But par but Tarantino had decided on Uma Thurman immediately after their first meeting. Also, Jennifer Aniston, in an interview with Tarantino, he said that Jennifer Aniston almost got the role of Mia Wallace. Wow! So I believe that he had her in mind after meeting with her. But then when he met Uma, he's like, Uma's the Uma's Mia Wallace. Like she's Mia Wallace. But Jennifer Aniston. And it was a pretty recent interview, was very close to getting in the role. Uma's so young in this movie. Was she like 23, 24 years old? She's too? probably younger than her daughter is right now. Yeah. She's probably yeah, I think she's in the early 20s. Yeah. And she's from Massachusetts too, which is cool. Oh, really? She what almost part? didn't want to do the movie. I can't remember what part, but she's from Wow. 
That's so cool. She's from Mass Kid. I have a really cool Bruce Willis story. Do you want to go to our intermission? Then you can tell us that really cool Bruce Willis story. Oh, it's going to be awesome. Oh, yeah. You don't want to miss it, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> got you on the cliffhanger. <laughs> guess you're going to have to keep listening to yeah, our ads. I guess you'll have to now. Before we continue, the best way to support Raiders of the Lost Podcast is to become a patron. Great segue. At patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. We have five different tiers where you can support us for as little as $2, then $5, $10, $25, or $100. Each tier comes with a bunch of awesome perks. The top $100 tier comes with a custom episode. You get to come on the show after three months for a fun guest segment. We're bringing you in for the intermission and a little bit after that, as well as tons of other perks for all of these tiers. Also, if you're starting a podcast and you kind of want to get the ropes and understand like how to make a successful show like we've been able to do over the last few years, we have a masterclass online that you can download and use. The link is podcastmasterclass.teachable.com. We put together a bunch of video lessons to teach you everything we did for our show so you can learn the ropes and get your show going as quickly as possible. This episode is sponsored by our great friends at MoviePosters.com. Use our promo code at their website to get 10% off your order today. They have a gigantic library of pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable for posters as well as all sorts of sizes, framing, and even backlighting for your poster needs. And they are doing our movie poster giveaway contest in this episode. So if you want to enter for a chance to win a movie poster, make a comment on the video episode of Pulp Fiction on our YouTube channel. That will automatically enter you into the poster contest. We will pick a winner in one week, so good luck to everyone. And in the meantime, if you don't win, be sure to head on over to MoviePosters.com for all of your poster needs and use our promo code Raiders10 to get 10 off your order today. That's all we got for ads. That wasn't so bad. That's so bad. Ever since uh, Manscaped dropped Don't us. even say their name. <laughs> Don't say their fucking name! Don't use that coupon code anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I want to cut it out of our YouTube episode. I wish we could. We can. <laughs> we can trim it up. We could, yeah. We just Actually, can't take it out of the audio. We should hire someone to do that. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of work. It's so time consuming. It's a lot of ads. Let's get back into the show, into our intermission, and begin with our movie quote competition. You ready, Anthony? I'm ready. There is no doubt our attractions. Hold on, let me, let me start oh, that over. There is no doubt our attractions will drive kids out of their minds. Jurassic Park. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Give everyone a second, man. Sorry, man. I'm sorry. You, we get it. You're smart at movie stuff, bro. <laughs> Here's my quote. I just went out there and performed sexual favors. 634 blowjobs in five days. I'm really quite tired. <laughs> what the hell? It's a great line. What is me, that? Want me to say it again? Yeah. <laughs> I just went out there and performed sexual favors. 634 blowjobs in five days. I'm really quite tired. <laughs> I don't know. Aaron Brockovich. Oh. When the uh, other lawyers are, the lawyers are like, how'd you get all this information so yeah, quickly? Yeah. She just showed them up and just made a joke about it. It's a great movie. Yeah. Good quote. Moving on to movie release year. Anthony. James. What year did Gattaca come out? Give everyone a moment. I don't think I'll be right. 1997. Correct. Yes! <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. That's where Maya Hawk was made. <laughs> they, they, she the was made during the conception. She was made during the filming of, of that Maya movie, Hawk. they said. <laughs> All right, here's my movie release here Pretty Woman. Pretty Woman. I knew you were going to sing it. 1987. 90. 1990. The year of our birth. <laughs> Day of our Lord. <laughs> Movie pop quiz time. We should release that deleted scene from we the should. short We have film. a funny deleted scene. James had his cameo. It's great. Anthony cut it. I thought I was going to be famous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're going to be famous from a short film that nobody sees. That's what I thought was going to happen. <laughs> it's over, man. It's over. I'll never be an actor. It's over before it started, man. Yep. <laughs> Name three movies Quentin Tarantino wrote the screenplay or story for, but didn't direct. True Romance. One. From Dusk Till Dawn. Two. Like a co-screenwriter? Story or screenplay credit. Story or screenplay credit. Crimson Tide. No. He doesn't have a story credit. Oh, he's, no. He just helped the screenplay. Okay, hold on. Let me think. Three Rooms. Four Rooms, but Four he's rooms. got a writing credit and a directing. Because he directed his yeah, room. segment, yeah. So it doesn't count. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, just writing. Or yeah. yeah. Co co just a co-writer. Sorry, I'm... It's okay. <laughs> Give me a second. 
<laughs> <That's> table eight. <laughs> um, man, this is a good question. That's a really good question. Han, you're gonna be pissed. <laughs> Grindhouse? No, he because he wrote and directed. Because Grindhouse is death proof in yeah, so he's, it's part of it. Oh, so it's not not Robert Rodriguez's. Oh wait, is it Sin City? No. Damn it, I don't know. Natural Born Killers. No! <laughs> <laughs> I thought you got that. Oh my god. I knew that. He has a story credit on that. Not a screenplay credit, a story credit. Oh man, I but knew that. But he did that. the screenplay for a True Romance in From Dust Till Dawn. Yeah, Oliver Stone made Natural Born Killers. Woody and Juliet. It's a good movie. God damn. It's got his style all over it. Yeah. Okay, here's my quiz question. Who directed Aaron Brockovich? Rob Reiner. Eh. Um, Oliver Stone. Uh. Uh-uh. Uh. Who is? I don't know. Steven Soderbergh. Oh man, that's such a Soderbergh movie. Yeah. yeah. Oh man. All right, Anthony. Do we have any haters this week? What do we got? Oh, yeah. Hold on. Sorry. Well, I, we have some Twitter haters I that, got right here. Yeah. that I brought up on Movie News, but in case you didn't tune in, you oh, got yeah, yeah, go to check these out. So we went semi-viral on film Twitter, which I thought would be a lot more fun than it was because uh, I just gave my opinion about something. And then this is what we got in response from a couple of haters. We got someone said, hold on, let me pull it up. Let me pull it up. Here we go. Give me a moment. Just... Just bear with me, everyone listening. I know you're in your car and you're in traffic. You're like, hurry up, Jim. Pull it up. All right, here we go. Cool, cool, bro. Enjoy your 12th time jerking off to the Fablemans. <laughs> <laughs> what a psycho. Well, you have no taste in movies, and plus, he made Terminator. I mean, come on. This is a movie. This is a, a tweet that I made about the last 25 years in movies, but this person obviously didn't tweet before 1997. They definitely didn't read that, yeah. And then, yet no one asked about your shit taste. That so, was so just as angry. So t- film Twitter's fun. Um, yeah, that's all I gotta say about that. But I am I have been blowing up the Twitter man. I've been killing it. Good man. We're, Keep we're, going. we're getting a lot of follows and we're I'm killing it on there. All Raiders right. Lost Pod on Twitter. Raiders Lost Pod. All right, I have some unsubscribes. Will's creepy basement wrote unsubscribe. That was it. <laughs> no reason. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Matt Tallin, eight seven seven, eight four seven seven. I still can't tell them apart. Unsubscribe. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse Madeer wrote, if I don't win one of your movie poster contests someday, I'll have to unsubscribe. <laughs> Sorry, pal. The Maybe Joe- you win this one. Yeah. The Joe By broadcast. You're getting fed up with constant origin stories? Unsubscribe. <laughs> 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 and then Ariana Castro. Unsubscribe, not fast enough. I can't remember what it was pertaining to. I screenshotted it, but sorry. But it was a great one. It was, it was funny. I have an unsubscribe on Twitter. So oh, I, yeah? I did a poll, actually, for Pulp Fiction on Instagram and Twitter for who is your favorite duo. I'll reveal the results of that poll. I can't wait to hear After it. the intermission. And the wisest wizard wrote, no Django and Dr. Schultz, unsubscribed. And I wrote, not in the movie, resubscribe. He's wrote, I'm a silly bitch, Def read that wrong, resubscribe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm deaf a silly bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been throwing a couple back the wisest wizard. They skimmed it. They skimmed, they skimmed it. the tweet. They skimmed, they skimmed, the, they skimmed it. the this, he skimmed the one sentence. We appreciate it's you though. Too many bro. letters, man. We appreciate you. <laughs> it's 140 <laughs> letters, man. <laughs> He's a nice guy. Um, all right, what do we got next for the intermission? Do we have any uh Godfather patrons or we, we do. Oh, who we got? We have Josh Perez. Josh! Thank you so much for being a Godfather patron. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for being a Godfather. So much. <laughs> Josh, the day of Madonna's wedding. You became a patron. <laughs> what was that voice? What happened to your mouth? I don't know, man. <laughs> it's like there's extra teeth in your mouth. <laughs> I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but Josh, thank you for being a patron. It helps us keep the lights off for the show. Helps Sorry, Anthony this, blew it. Helps us do this full time. <laughs> <laughs> and Josh, he picked the Goonies for his bonus review. Nice. Great pick. I'll do the truffle shuffle for you on camera. <laughs> I always, certainly hope you don't. <laughs> we have, uh, but that review will be coming out this weekend. This week. Yeah, this week, weekend. Thanks, <laughs> this weekend. Th- thanks, Josh. Appreciate you. <laughs> now, we have a great new five-star review from... Paul Dale, 97, on iTunes. If you want to leave a five-star review and hey, Paul. put it on iTunes, 
I'll read it out on the show for you. This is from Paul. Needing something new. Sounds like a great infomercial ad already. Found these guys scrolling through Spotify. Wow, you found us on Spotify. So cool. Must have been our thumbnail. Trying to find something new to listen to while working out. Getting those fucking gains, bro. (laughs) (laughs) Did they write that? No. (laughs) I was tired of listening to the same music day after day. But with these guys bring something new and entertaining every episode, I find myself watching new movies that James and Anthony recommend throughout the week that I normally wouldn't have. I have a rule that if I don't laugh at least once during every episode, I'll unsubscribe. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't see that happening. Oh, thanks, bud. Definitely one of my top three podcasts. Whoa, we're not top one? Come on, Paul. Just kidding. <laughs> Paul, thank you so much for listening to us. We're so glad you found us on Spotify. So it's glad that, that new you, thumbnail, bro. Yeah, it must be the new, new thumbnail. thumbnail. It's, it's catchy. It's orange. We appreciate you tuning in. <laughs> it's orange. It's pops. Paul, thank you again for the five-star review. It means a lot to us. Thanks, Paul. You're the best. Thanks, guy. <laughs> get those gains, bro. Yeah, if you're if you're doing a set right now, you got this. Pump it, man. Pump it, bro. Pump it. <laughs> get through that. Get through that set. Come on, go, go, go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. My streaming recommendation for this episode is the Hustler, Paul Newman's pool hustling classic, is now on Amazon Prime. Check it out if you haven't. My rec is the Terminator. It just got put on HBO Max for February twenty. Thought you hated James Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you thought he was a piece of shit. I feel, I, <laughs> I feel bad whoever's like listening to us like at work with their computer desktop without headphones. Like the last minute it's been like, yeah, bro, get it at the gym. <laughs> They're like, oh, I listened to this Pulp Fiction review. This, get swole. this should be a great episode and nice and chill. <laughs> I'm sure they won't talk about testosterone. <laughs> All right. Let's let's get composed get back into our episode of Pulp Fiction. And as I advertised during the intermission, I did a poll on Twitter and Instagram where I asked, what is your favorite duo or who is your favorite duo from Pulp Fiction? The options are Jules and Vincent, Mia and Vincent, Butch and Marcellus, or Pumpkin and Honey Bunny. Can you guess, Anthony, which was the most popular on both platforms? I'm going to guess Jules and Vincent one. Correcto. So on Instagram, Jules and Vincent won 64% of the vote. Whoa. Mia Wallace and Vincent got 18%. Butch and Marcellus got 13%. Pumpkin and Honey Bunny got 5%. Then on Twitter, Jules and Vincent got 69%, almost the same exact numbers. Mia and Vincent, 16%. Butch and Marcellus, 8%. Pumpkin and Honey Bunny, 7%. Wow, matching. Pretty damn, pretty damn close. I think you can call that like a, a legit survey then. Yeah, yeah I, I survey people nowadays. <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> I think that's, uh, that I'm not surprised at all by, that's, if I was going to pick one, two, three, four, that's probably how I would. Um, I would it. go Jules and Vincent is my favorite for yeah. sure. They're just so memorable and they're, they're one of the best duos in the history of film. And in- so fun to watch because whenever I, now I watch Vince and Jules, it feels like the way we talk a lot of times where we're not like arguing, but we're like debating, debate bickering where people think we're fighting, but this is just yeah. how we debate. And we, we'll, yeah. we'll debate the silliest things just like Jules and Vincent yeah. for minutes on end. And um, we always, we'll always end them like, all right, that's an interesting point. <laughs> like, I, like, I don't agree with you, but I respect your opinion. Yeah. And that's a great topic. But that's, that's exactly what Jules <laughs> says to Vincent when he convinces him that, you know, it's some that's giving, a a, giving a, someone a foot massage is an intimate thing. And he's like, all right, interesting point. And I was like, that's exactly how we talk. <laughs> <laughs> now, I promised a Bruce Willis casting story, so I'm going to get into it now. So the role of Vincent, like I said, was difficult to cast. Not only did Daniel Day-Lewis want the role, but Bruce Willis wanted the role of Vincent. And I'm getting this from Tarantino himself. It's an interview he did recently describing the casting process. I believe it was on Joe Rogan. He had he did a great three minute, three-hour talk about all of his films, about his history, about all sorts of stuff. Yeah, it's a great interview. Terrific interview. And he talked about casting Vincent Vega. He talked about how Bruce Willis, he loved the script, but he was adamant about playing Vincent Vega. And Tarantino had to go to him and be like, I know you like Vincent, but I have Travolta for this role. That's who I want. I see you as Butch. And Bruce Willis turned that down. He's like, I don't, I don't want to play Butch. I want Vincent. And so they took some time away, and then they, they got together again. And from what he said, he said they, they went on a walk at a, on a beach. Bruce Willis had, like, uh, invited him over, and they just went walking. And Bruce still, he was like, I want Vince. I want to play Vince. It's, like, the best role in the movie, he thought. But Tarantino's like, I think Butch is, like, the perfect role for you. 
And the thing is, Vincent Vega, you kind of look at him, He, you could look at him as like a lead of the film, possibly, but, I mean, Butch is definitely, I would say, if you're going to look at who's the lead of the film, it's definitely Vincent over, over Butch. I bet you Bruce won it because Butch comes in too late. Yeah, that, but also, like, Vincent has a lot of scenes. Butch doesn't have as many scenes, so it's just like a bigger star role. He's a, he's a superstar at the time. And so Tarantino said, all right, here's the thing. You read the script with Vince in mind for yourself. So read it again and picture yourself as Butch. Read it again without thinking about Vincent Vega. Just think about me as Butch and let me know what you think. And then Tarantino got a call the next day. It was Bruce Willis, and he said, I'm in. I'll play Butch. So once he read it again through the lens of Butch and wanting to play and thinking of himself as the character of Butch, then it clicked and then it made sense. And then he, then he understood what Tarantino was going for with wanting him as Butch. Yeah, it works so well. And that's why it's, he's my favorite character in the entire film. And I love the gold watch chapter, how it's split up. But I, I love the sequences of, you know, like I said earlier, with Fabian. But I, I think with Maynard and Zed, the two serial killing rapists, it's just such a great redemption story that we talked about earlier. But it's also one of the most badass scenes of all time. That's so iconic now, and it's kind of been like a little reference in Ode. I mean, he obviously didn't predict Precursor. This. Precursor to the future films, which are multiple in this movie. Obviously, the Fox Force 5 alluding to the Kill Bill, Deadly Viper assassination squad with all those female assassins, <laughs> which Uma Thurman's Mia Wallace plays in the pilot, uh, the Knives one, obviously Beatrix Kiddo. So, in, so interesting. No, she doesn't play the Knives one. She plays the Knives girl. Does she? Yeah. The least woman in the world with an Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. That's yeah. her. Never mind. Yeah, her old grand her grandfather was an old pavilion who knew a million old jokes. Did you watch the fucking movie, Anthony? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, salty. Just kidding. But you want but some I, pepper with but that I salt? Love, <laughs> that scene's one of, it's one of the best moments in the movie. You know, when the door closes and obviously Marcellus Wallace has having a horrible situation going He's on. Having back a bad there. time. He's having a bad day. <laughs> and then I, I think it's a great use of music here, a great needle drop that is one of gonna be one of our uh superlatives that we have in our list, where they're playing the song It is Comanche by the Rebels. And it, it fits perfectly to the mood of this moment of Butch escaping from the chair punching out the gimp, and then about to leave, but then I'm going to go save Marcellus Wallace. Let me check what they have for weapons to use. He goes through the hammer. He goes through the baseball bat. He goes through the handheld chainsaw, and then he finds that samurai sword. It's so incredible. He's covered in blood. His nose is broken. The, the wardrobe design looks perfect with the sweat and the blood. It's it's an uh, iconic outfit, just the T-shirt with the blood all over it and the blue jeans. And he gets the samurai sword, goes down there. It's so Badass! It's so cool when he pulls that curtain. He's got the samurai sword. He's like, <gasps> he's like melts like a gabe. He's like ready to slice somebody up, and it's it's amazing. It's I've never seen anything like it. And people always question, what is up with this gimp? What is what is this in this movie? Why why is this here? It's because it's shocking. It's interesting. You never seen anything like it before. Yeah, and I love the weapons because, uh, except for the chainsaw, these are all weapons that became pretty legendary in Tarantino movies. You have the hammer, Calvin Candy using the hammer. And then the baseball bat with the bear Jew in Inglorious Bastards. And then obviously the samurai sword with Beatrix Kiddo. Uh, and used... then Chainsaw would be Grindhouse, right? But he didn't make that yeah, one. Yeah, but it's, I'm wondering Robert if it's Rodriguez. like, yeah, I know. But still, you could relate it to his filmography in a way. So the Chainsaw still, still has a connection, which is really interesting. And I I read online, there's like this whole fan theory about the samurai sword being Butch's, not being um, Bud's from Kill Bill. No, he, no. But it's no like way. he didn't he didn't pawn it. He said he pawned it, but it was sitting it's in, in the his trailer. closet. It's in the, it was it's there. The golf bag. I was like, I was reading these threads online. I was like, how can you think this? Because the sword is in his trailer. He never never pawned it. He didn't pawn it. So <laughs> it's the dumbest thing I ever heard. That makes him a liar. <laughs> <laughs> Did they not watch Kill Bill? I thought, I, but I thought Bud pawned it. Guess, Guess you that. didn't watch the fucking movie. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I, I love, I love uh, but Butch, the weapons. Butch in general, it fits Bruce so well, and he's such a cool character. That's all the characters. In this it's movie because are cool. he's quiet, soft spoken, but also intimidating and just like effortlessly cool. But also like a uh, just like someone you don't want to fight. You it's the bravado. Yeah, he has that. And he's also, got the it quality. Yeah, and Butch is an interesting character because you, if you look at it, the reason why he's a boxer is because he's a fighter, and he, he, he's completely, his entire life is defined by the watch and its legacy. 
and all of his forefathers, his, his father, his grandfather, his great grandfather, they all were fighters. They fought in wars. Butch never had a war to fight in, so that's why he's a boxer. Because... He's like Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> <Shut> <laughs> so that's why he never. That's why he's a fighter. That's why he's a boxer because his his forefathers were fighters, and so. He that's I, my guess is why he gravitated towards boxing. No, I agree absolutely. And he goes to war and through hell to get the watch back. Exactly, and risks yeah. his life just like all his his yeah. the patriarchs of his family did. All right, next up, next superlative. What is your favorite story chapter? My favorite chapter is the Bonnie situation. Ah, oh, good one. Because Jules and Vincent are my favorite combo. But the Bonnie situation is everything from the prelude where they're in the car, they get the briefcase, then. Marvin's head gets shot. Oh, man, I shot Marvin, Marvin in the face. face. <laughs> it's just so funny. and You've got to have an opinion. Ridiculous, because it's just like a normal day for these gangsters. And it's like, obviously, most movies show gangsters doing, like, such cool stuff. And it's like an alluring lifestyle. But then you see, like, what what would happen if everything went wrong, but it's kind of comical at the same time? Yeah. What would happen if you actually shot someone in the, in the head in the back seat? Because you're Vince Vega, you're, like, not that great at your you job. You must have hit a bump or something. <laughs> I didn't hit no bump. <laughs> <laughs> man, the gun just went off, man. I don't know, man. I don't know what happened. <laughs> you better call somebody. I mean, we're in the valley, man. But the whole situation then going to Jimmy's house and fixing the car up and cleaning the blood off. I think the dialogue, the wolf is so fascinating, such a great character. The banter between Vince and Jules is hysterical. The whole entire sequence is incredible. But that also includes the diner situation as well, pretty much. But the, the Barney situation, I think, is my favorite. That's a great pick, and it's definitely the most comical. And like them washing, washing their hands in the sink, and you watched me wash them. <laughs> you, wa you got blood over his towel. <laughs> it, it, it didn't, didn't look, look like, like a damn maxi, maxi pad. pad. <laughs> <laughs> it still gets me every time. <laughs> Canceled. <laughs> you know how good I know how good my coffee is. You need to tell me how good my coffee is. It's just I, there's so much good cough, good um, good writing, <laughs> good comedy in, in that sequence, and also he does uh, some of his fun like fantastical little tiny jokes like they do like a, he does a cut sequence where they're carrying the body and Bonnie comes home oh, Bonnie. Oh, hi. <laughs> Bonnie. <laughs> <laughs> it's just great it's like the family guy kind of joke yeah that they do like they always do this like side thing for like 10 seconds alluding to the joke Tarantino actually does that in all in a lot of his films I, I love that entire sequence it's ter it's terrific it's like Matter of fact, why am I on brain duty? We switched seats. You're picking up this motherfucker's brain. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I touch brain, I'm super fly TNT. <laughs> I'm a mushroom crown laying motherfucker, motherfucker. <laughs> I love it. It's why am so, I on brain detail? <laughs> <laughs> it's so goddamn funny. And then, uh, but my favorite story chapter is Butch and Marcellus. Because some of my favorite sequences. So the gold watch, though. The, the gold watch, the pawn shop. Uh, Zed and, and Maynard all of it it's because it's so unpredictable and it's so shocking and so fucked up and you've never seen anything like it before and just hit you like a ton of bricks the first time you see it where first they get captured and then you see they're tied up tied up with these balls in their mouths like chained tied to their mouths and then and then Marcel is going through what he's going through and then Butch saving him with a samurai sword it's so friggin bonkers and Nobody had ever seen like anything like it before. I had never seen anything like it before the first time I saw it. It was just mind blowing how unique and original it was. And also, it's just it's got it's also got great comedy. Whereas like when Marcellus just walks out in front of him on the crosswalk, he's like, "Motherfucker, <laughs> <laughs> you, Doctor Dangerous." You you get the you get the you get Vincent's death with. Great suspense where he finds the Uzi on his counter. He's like, what the fuck? And he picks it up. Then Vincent comes out of the bathroom. And they're just staring at each other for 10 seconds. Then the Pop-Tarts go off and D -d 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 you're dead. Also, the fire detector going off. I've never yeah, seen fire... that in any other movies. Yeah, so from, realistic. All the, from all the smoke. It's terrific attention to detail. I love that as well. I'm glad you mentioned that. In Fabian stuff, I just think the Butch sequence is so terrific. And that's it's why... Tarantino put it in the midway point because it's so incredible, so shocking, and he knew that would make audiences be like, what the fuck just happened? So yeah. I, I picked that one. Great point. All right, what's your uh, favorite monologue? Favorite monologue we already did. Okay, what's your favorite line? My favorite line is from Marcellus Wallace after Butch escapes and gets away. 
and he goes, if he goes to Indochina, I want a dude waiting in a bowl of rice to pop a cap in his ass. <laughs> <laughs> it cracks it cracks me up. I cackle like a maniac when I hear that line. It's so funny. My favorite line. It's so tough to choose. It is hard. It's it's almost impossible. I'm just I'm just grabbing one that I love though. Um Zed's dead, baby. Zed's dead. Yeah, you say that one a lot. That's... This might be the number one quoted movie in our lives. It could be. We yeah. quote it all the time. It could be. All right, next up. What's but, your wait, what happened to my Honda? I had a crash, a baby. Where, where'd you get that motorcycle? It's not a motorcycle, baby. It's a chopper. Where'd, where'd you, you get, get that, that chopper? chopper? <laughs> Zed. Who's Zed? Zed's dead, baby. Zed's dead. <laughs> What's your favorite costume? Butch. I think Butch's costume is great. I picked Butch, too. I the, love the, the light blue the Levi's white tea, and the brown bomber. The white chucks. Yeah. Yeah, the brown jacket. Yeah. It fits. It it's works. A great, it's a great outfit. It, it just works. And then and the, I feel and then like, when it's covered yeah. in blood, it looks great. Yeah, I feel like everyone will pick the like the, the, Vincent, suits. the suits. But I, I really like that outfit. It's a really cool look. Next up, what is your favorite shot? I'm going to go with... The camera's behind Marcellus Wallace's head, and we're looking at Butch. Showing the band-aid? The whole scene like that. Yeah. Whole dialogues like that. Or or just the shot of Butch. Which no, one? Well, the shot with, uh, with the band-aid in the head. The band-aid the back, in the head. So, like, yeah, so I op- the behind Marcellus Wallace's okay, head. Okay, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. Great pick. No, you said the whole thing. <laughs> I said behind Marcellus Wallace's you head. You said the look. whole dialogue scene. Behind... Because it's it's actually 30, 35 seconds of just Butch. What's your favorite shot? And then he goes, she's, did you even see the fucking film? That's what I wrote and said. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite shot is the Steadicam shot following Butch through the Los Angeles neighborhood. Oh, that's a cool shot. Steadicam is great. Uh, he used it a lot in his early days. And then Robert Richardson, I don't think, is a big fan of Steadicam. They're always using dolly and tracks and, and cranes and stuff. That's just, I think R- Richardson likes that style, and Tarantino ended up liking it more. But he did use uh, quite a bit of steady cam in his early days, and this is a great following tracking shot. Okay, next up, what's your favorite moment of the film? Like, just one moment. Butch with the samurai sword. Oh, great Rescuing pick. Rescuing Marcellus Wallace. Great pick. My favorite moment is when Butch killed Vince, and he's driving in LA. He's feeling good, he's feeling confident. The song <laughs> comes out, he's singing to it, he's like, up I'm and and then he stops at a red light and Marcellus walks in front of him the cross holding the donuts and he's like motherfuckers <laughs> and then he just rams it with his car it's so amazing it's terrific I love that moment next up what's your favorite kill so mine's a little complicated okay <laughs> because technically it doesn't happen in the movie but my favorite kill is Zed by Marcellus Wallace because ah, Marcellus pick. Wallace takes the shotgun and blows his dick off <laughs> <laughs> Deservedly so. And then he's going to keep him alive and torture him like crazy by hiring what he says are the pipe hidden dudes to go to town on him with a blowtorch and a pair of pliers. I'm going to get me an evil on your ass. So even though it's, we don't see it, that death is so deserved and, and it's crazy. It's, so it's Imagine what he went through. Imagine. That's, cr- that's a good pick. That's Enjoyed good pick. And he deserved every second. <laughs> I picked Marvin. <laughs> oh, shit, I shot Marvin in the oh, face. Because it's face. so shocking and comes out of nowhere. I mean, you also... gotta have an opinion. <laughs> the I gun... don't know, man. The gun just went off, man. You must have went over a pup or something. <laughs> <laughs> just blood everywhere. It's amazing. I love that. Okay, next up. What is your favorite needle drop? Now, a needle drop in a film is when music plays. And it's not... I would say it's tied for me. So I brought up earlier Comanche by the Revels, which plays as soon as that door closes with Marcellus Wallace and the rapist in the back. But then also Let's Stay Together by Al Green. I think it's just so classic, and it works so well with the Marcellus Wallace butch scene. Good pick. Good pick. I picked Dusty Springfield, Son of a Preacher Man. I think it's it really sits the tone of that scene and really adds so much to, the, to that sequence. I think it was really just like a magical couple of minutes with that song playing. There's still so much to talk about, so I would love to get into more depth on Vincent and Jules. Obviously, the most favorite duo in the film based off our polls that we did on Instagram and Twitter. Our favorite duo for sure. The most entertaining parts of the film, arguably, in terms of dialogue and banter. But their their scenes together have a lot more depth than just what's on the surface. I think the whole entire concept of... The divine intervention, the act of God stopping the bullets coming down and saving their lives is really interesting because 
there are ramifications for both men after that situation. You know, they're just going to this job. We should have shotguns. But their, their conversations are so terrific. And, you know, they're just talking about random stuff. We, we brought up the dialogue earlier. We have the foot massage conversation, debating whether or not it's intimate. Is it in the same ballpark as oral sex? We have the the Royale with cheese, little Big Mac, all that. The differences in Europe in, compared to America. And then getting into that apartment, like we talked about earlier, you brought up how, you know, Sam L. Jackson as Jules just controls that entire room. He's just so, he's charming, then the most terrifying human being on earth, and then they take them out. And there's so many little details in that scene that are, are terrific. Like, as Jules is going through his conversation, even though Vince hasn't been in town for three years, he's been in, in uh, Amsterdam, he still knows the game. He knows what Jules usually does, and you can see him slowly unbutton his suit, takes out the gun at specific moments of the dialogue that Jules is going because, getting at because he knows he's about to kill this guy, and he's about to do the Ezekiel, Ezekiel quote. Oh, he's still doing this. All right, let me get my gun ready. It's really fun when you watch the background of this scene to see the way that Vince is, what he's doing in the background. It's also a strategic position, too. Yeah, of, of course. Yeah. And then they take out Brett and Flock of Seagulls on the couch, which is a reference to a band in the 80s. And the guy in the bathroom, why, why didn't you tell us there's a guy? Why didn't you tell us there's a guy in the bathroom? You see the size of that gun? It's bigger than him. <laughs> <laughs> and he blows six shots from his revolver, hits nothing. And I love how Tarantino shows that they move away from the wall. The bullets should have killed them. Yeah, three of them are just over. Jules' shoulders, but then when they move out of the way, they clearly would have gone through his chest. It shows the huge difference between Vincent and Jules, where Vincent, he's not thinking too much about it. He's just playing it off as just dumb luck. Let's just get out of here before the cops show up. But Jules, his entire life changes from this moment because he believes that God came down and moved those bullets, stopped the bullets, turned water into wine, whatever. He thinks that it was an act of God, divine intervention, and from this moment, he decides that he's going to quit. He's going to get that case to Marcellus Wallace. But after that, he's done. He's going to tell Marcellus, I'm out of there. I'm going to walk the earth like uh, Kane, Kane Kung and Fu. Kung Fu. And get on Vincent, adventures. Vincent thinks, <laughs> <laughs> Vincent thinks it's silly. And it's ridiculous. And they get in the great debates about it. But then you look at what happens to both characters after this moment. You know, Jules quits the game. We don't see what happens to him chronologically after this point, after the diner. After he brings the case to Marcellus, he's just gone. What happens to Vince? Vince gets into even more trouble. He leaves the heroin inside his pocket. Mia Wallace overdoses on it thinking it's cocaine. And then he has to give her the adrenaline shot and save her life. And then he gets killed by Butch. That's his life after this moment because he didn't... You could say that because he didn't take this supposed divine act of God seriously, that it cost him his life. And he just went back to the norm of his not being great or or tentative at his job or just not taking things seriously. But also you could say that he wouldn't have died if Jules hadn't had the change of heart because he probably would have been in the apartment with him. Because, and keeping him in line. Because Vincent, because Jules is the, is the leader of the two of them, and he's the guy who handles things. He's the one who handles the briefcase. Vincent... Vincent's good at his job, but he's not, like, someone you can super trust. Obviously, Marcellus loves the guy and is happy to see him, and clearly he's done a lot of work for him. But, like, you need Jules there to handle situations. Vince is there because you need to kill someone. Vince will be there to take them out. And who? You, not many people can kill people for money. You know what I mean? It's still a very specific job. Could I do murder? I think, what's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> the divided reference. <laughs> <laughs> so that's also why... Vincent gets killed because he just makes bad decisions. Like, he thinks it's like, okay, I'm just going to leave my gun out and take a dump, even though I'm waiting in Butch's apartment. He could show up. I He's probably he's like, he's probably not going to show up here. Like, why would he come to his apartment? So that's what gets him killed because he's not, he's not as intelligent as Jules. Jules is extremely intelligent, extremely well-spoken, has a great grasp of people and understands situations. He's playing chess. Jules, Vincent is just like, his support system, but J J Jules, Vincent's the support system, and Jules is like leader. He's commanding whatever room he's in. He's also reading a book in multiple scenes. Yeah. He's reading the one in the uh, bathroom in the diner, but he's also reading that book when he gets killed by Butch. He's reading Modesty Blaze, which was written in 1965, a spy novel by Peter O'Donnell, like Fox Force 5, the fictional television pilot that Mia appears in, in within the film. Modesty Blaze features a female spy with many different talents. Bad things happen when he goes to the bathroom. <laughs> so when he goes to the bathroom, <clears throat> first, uh, <laughs> Mia Wallace overdoses. <laughs> and then Pumpkin and Honey Bunny hold up the restaurant. 
and then Butch shows up in the apartment and ends up killing him. So every time Vincent goes to the bathroom, something terrible happens. I wonder if he has IBS because he takes like two bites of bacon and he's off to take a shit. Keep in mind, it is the morning though. True, a sip it's of coffee. 8, it's 8 a.m. You know what I love about the, the whole Bonnie situation? It's taking place, like, by 8 o'clock. Yeah. The wolf is wearing a tuxedo. Yeah, I'm always <laughs> curious. Like, what's the... My, I'm guessing it's some kind of... A, it could be, like, a church thing or, or something. A wake. Like, a wake. Some kind of celebration. I always assume it's, like, a wake. Yeah, it's something to be happening that early. Because why else would you be dressed formally that early yeah, in the morning that, at a house? Wearing a tux. And so I always think that it's something, like, maybe it's, like, I don't know, a baptism of some... But it's someone important, obviously, and someone wealthy. And I love how the wolf is clearly a different class of person from everyone. Like, even when he's talking to Jimmy about the linens, he's like, I'm an oak man. I have oak in my bedroom. And then Jimmy's like, oak's nice. <laughs> <laughs> like, who imagine how expensive, like, a oak set, a bedroom set it is. The, the wolf is such an incredible character and so memorable in Tarantino's entire filmography. He dresses sharp. He drives fast. He takes his coffee, lots of cream, lots of sugar. He talks fast. He acts fast. I love every line of dialogue he says. It's sharp. It's witty. He's kind of like James Bond. A little bit. Yeah. He's just like a wisecracking James Bond fixer. Yeah. But it, it's like you need that. Like, what kind of person would that be like if it existed? And it probably does exist in the criminal underworld and the mob. Like, Oh, yeah, they're fixers. They're fixers. What would that really be like in a Tarantino world? And I, I love how he created that character. And it's he's built up perfectly because Jules is panicking. He's on the phone with Marcellus. And, and then he's like... I got the wolf coming to you directly. And then he's like, shit, that's all you had to say. You, got, you call him the wolf? <laughs> <laughs> we already know, whoa, this guy must be a big deal for Jules to react like this, to go from panicking to being super calm and kind of excited. You Plus know what he I mean? drives that Acura NSX. Yeah. Ooh, that thing is sick. Those are a fucking... Acura's those were nice were, back then. The NSXs were nice, oh, dude. Yeah. They it's kind of like a, like a sports car yeah, for it's a sports, streets. Yeah, yeah, a sports car from the early 90s. Uh -huh. It's really big. Acura's NSX was really popular back then. Yeah, very cool, very cool. I think I'm pretty sure they've been discontinued for a while, though. Yeah. But Kaitel obviously has his imprint on Tarantino in his early days. He actually was very instrumental in getting Reservoir Dogs made. And clearly, I mean, who Tarantino wrote this. It's perfect for him. One Kai, of his all-time favorite actors. Yeah, and Kaitel, it's one of it's one of his best roles in... Even in his illustrious filmography, it's like the wolf is still one of the tops, and, and he's in some of the greatest movies ever made. He's in like 12 minutes of the – well, probably a little more, but he does not have a lot of screen time, but yeah. he's so memorable. And I love how uh, when, when they're done and they both shake his hand, Jules is like, hey, it was a pleasure watching you work. And he's like – and Jules is like, I was surprised. He didn't even freak out when you were fucking with him. <laughs> <laughs> a please would be nice. Those are just minor details, though, that make dialogue yeah. so authentic. A please would be nice. The hand towel thing. The coffee being good. When Bonnie goes out, she buys shit. I buy the gourmet expensive stuff because I like to taste my coffee. That's just stuff that people the say. The clothes. Everything. You've all been to county, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> what do they look like, Jimmy? Dorks. A couple, couple of dorks. dorks. Uh -huh, you're, you're clothes, clothes motherfucker. motherfucker. <laughs> Guys, I see your future. A cab ride. <laughs> Get out of the sticks, fellas. <laughs> and they do live in the sticks. Of course, you are yeah. a character. It doesn't mean you have character. <laughs> it's just. Oh, I love the notebook when he's when the wolf gets the call. He's, he's <laughs> it's sitting. Great. He's the sitting notes on are the, amazing. Yeah, he's sitting on the phone and he's taking notes from clearly Marcellus Wallace is filling him in on the situation. And he writes Vincent parentheses white Jules parentheses black and then dead body head question mark no head question no mark. head. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny because then he walks in here he knows everybody he knows the situation you know something I, like that I would that. love to see that entire notepad yeah that's great basically George Clooney's film Michael Clayton is basically like a non non comedic version of him he plays a fixer for, yeah. for major corporations and he, his his storyline is being screwed over by a, a corporation that tries to take him out even though he was trying to fix something for them but the person who hired the hit on him didn't understand what he was doing it's a good movie. You don't. I don't know. You're not a big fan of it, but it's, it's, it's pretty good. I think it's. I'm not. It's not that I'm not a big fan of it. I just uh. think it's a little overrated. I didn't love it when I watched it. But so he hates maybe it. I'll. I'll. I'll give it another shot. I haven't. James seen Cameron it. made it. <laughs> <laughs> apparently, I hate James Cameron. Apparently, apparently. apparently. I like Steven Spielberg than more than James Cameron's movies. So I'm a bad film person. <laughs> I love that. But the, I love the Wolf. But let, I got. We got to talk about the editing too. It's so effective in this movie. We dabbled in it earlier when we were talking about how much dialogue actually gets left on the cutting room floor of movies, especially movies written by auteurs who write so much dialogue like Quentin Tarantino. 
of course there's going to be dialogue in his shooting script that doesn't fit the standard for the rest of the film and there's ways to chop up dialogue with people to make it more effective and last longer and just work for a scene better and you got to make those tough decisions but the editing is so effective in this movie because of the cuts are so shocking in terms of where they happen in the story i mean for example one of my favorite cuts of the entire film happens so early on where it's jules and vincent and they're the big kahuna burger scene with a briefcase and they shoot and kill Brad, Brett, Brent, whatever his name is, whatever Sam L's saying at whatever specific moment. And then the next time we see these guys, they're in these goofy outfits. Yeah. We don't know why. That's why the nonlinear storytelling and cutting and editing is so effective because the mystery, the suspense, it's like on the edge of your seat, like, wait, what's going on? Why are these guys in these silly outfits? They were just cold-blooded killers in black suits and ties. How did they get to this situation? That's so fascinating as an audience member. This is one of those movies that whenever someone asks, what's a movie you could watch for the first time if you could just erase it from your memory? It's like between this and The Matrix because this was that one of those movies where it just blew my mind, the non-layer storytelling, how effective it is for you. My favorite edit and Sally Menke is the editor. She edited um, all Tarantino's films until she passed away recently. Uh, rest in peace. Once Upon a Time was the only one she didn't do, right? Yeah. Uh, she passed away after Hateful Eight. Uh, she's a terrific editor. And my favorite edit is after Vincent does the heroine. And we get these great close-ups that you mentioned earlier. But with Tarantino and Sally, they cut between Vincent driving. And he's got this look on his face of ecstasy driving the car with the rear projection in the background, with that cool bass line playing. And then he cuts, keeps cutting back to close-ups of the heroin being used. And I think it's just an amazing edit. It's really up there for his entire filmography. The beautiful close-ups, crazy, perfect, cool music, and then Vincent Vega driving that car in, at the night. It's one of the best drug sequences ever filmed. It makes yeah. you feel like you're high when you're watching it. But you put he you put yourself in Vincent Vega's shoes so effectively. I think another movie that does drug sequences so well is Aronofsky's Re Requiem for a Dream. Yeah, he gets so creative with that movie and the great references to Perfect Blue, uh, the anime, right? Yep. And I think that or I could be wrong with the, which with the title of the anime, but I think That's this it. this sequence. The heroin shoot up sequence of Vince Vega. I watch and I feel like I just shot. I just am like dazed. Yeah, he makes he makes the tone and the style of the film match the feeling that he's going through. So it's just incredible editing. Incredible. Is there so many great cinematography yeah. shots too? And film. And I think one of my favorites that probably flies under the radar is when they pull into Jack Rabbit Slims, and it's just the windshield. It's the first time we see Mia Wallace's face. And it's the reflection of the neon lights from the restaurant are on the windshield. And it's just like a great framing of this restaurant we're about to enter, adding so much to this shot. And I love how Vince keeps walking through the restaurant because he's so high. He, he stumbles know, against the car. Yeah, he didn't notice. <laughs> he didn't notice that they already stopped like ten tables back. It's, it's terrific. But you can see that there there is one cut that is, I mean, a little jarring. I, I mean, I, I never noticed it until I researched the film where I said that there's actually the deleted scene where she. In the house, she's filming Vincent before they go to Jackrabbit Slims, and she's filming him and asking him questions. And what they did to cut around that was they had the close-up of her foot, and then it cuts to Jackrabbit Slims. But she says this line is clearly ADR by Uma Thurman in post-production, saying, we... ready to go? Or something like Let's that. Let's go. Let's go. But And then that, that dialogue is voiced over the close-up of her foot. Rather than playing the scene out, that's how they got out of that scene by cutting a, by cutting out by trimming that entire sequence. They got out by just adding that dialogue in. Yeah. Well, that's would, clearly where they were gonna do the recording scene. Since we're on the topic, I would love to talk about Jackrabbit Slims. Yeah, this is such a cool part of the film, and sometimes I feel like maybe some people watch it and they're like, "What's the point of this? We don't have to have this." 15 minute scene in a restaurant and it takes like four minutes just to get to the car that they're sitting in to have their dinner i think it adds such a pulse to the film it's so unique and fun this fictional restaurant that they built from scratch this was all created as a huge part of the budget went to just building jackrabbit slims plus so many extras and so many characters from film and pop culture at the time. I mean, like the host of the the the, the restaurant, like he's Richard Nixon. Then we have Buddy Holly. We have Marilyn Monroe. James Dean walks past them. Buddy Holly is the waiter played with a cameo by Steve Buscemi, which is so fun. So, so many great references to pop culture because I have an entire list that I'll get into later on of like all the movies and TV right shows that he's referencing. Oh, after Jack Rabbit Slims. All right. 
because I love the scene so much and I love the the theme of the uncomfortable silence is because this movie is so risky, the decisions he makes in terms of the writing, the filmmaking. But to have an entire sequence play out about uncomfortable silences with an uncomfortable silence, how many people have the cojones to put an uncomfortable silence in their movie and the, like an integral part? You're halfway through the film. You're an hour in. And you're going to put just like a 40-second silence between two characters, which it's not the first time it's ever been done before, but it's done so well. And it's brought up naturally in a weird way. It's an uncomfortable silence that talked about how normal people talk about uncomfortable silences. You can see that Tarantino is really influenced by European filmmakers at this time and in the 60s and 70s as well, like especially the French New Wave where scenes didn't have to involve actual plot, but it was more about what's life like? What are just moments like? This entire scene has nothing to do with the plot. It has no bearing on the story. It's all just character. It's all just you know an experience, and it makes the characters feel like they're real people. And he really tapped into that. Like he, one of his favorite movies is Breathless by Godard, and he just kind of redefined how you make a movie without a plot and just having just just scenes of everyday life and just people talking normally. And obviously, like Elmore Leonard novels have a lot of that as well. And so he drew inspiration from you know people who were crafting stories that weren't the norm. And that's what the sequence is. It's I mean, just, the whole movie is yeah, kind of whole, plotless. Yeah, and th- but th- this this scene is so memorable. It's so loved by by fans and by audiences everywhere, and yet it doesn't have anything to do with the plot. And that's what makes it really special. And Tarantino, he understood that. He's like, you know what? This scene is just fucking awesome. It's and great. I, and I'm just going to put it in. Cause it's I'm, like a time machine. Yeah, and it's just really special. Absolutely. It's, it's really, I think, like I said, it gives a pulse to the movie. It really makes it something special. It, it adds to the special quality of the movie. And, and then I, the dance is just yeah. amazing. And, and Uma Thurman apparently was extremely nervous to do the dance scene because she was very self-conscious dancing opposite John Travolta, who was probably like the most famous acting dancer, actor dancer in the, in the, in the world uh, because he was in two Saturday Night Fever movies and it was just like his thing being such a good dancer. But she did a terrific job opposite him. I have a great uh, anecdote about the dance. So Let's do it. given his dance background, even winning a twist contest when he was eight, Travolta took the lead in Vincent and Mia's iconic dance sequence and won the MTV Movie Award for Best Dance Sequence, of course. While Tarantino had just envisioned the twist being played out on that stage, Travolta recalled telling the director, quote, you may add another, you may add other novelty dance- dancers that were very special in the day. He said, what do you mean? I said, there was the Batman, the Hitchhiker, the Swim, as well as the Twist, and I showed them to him, and he loved them. I said, I'll teach Uma the steps, and when you want to see a different step, call it out. And that's how the film's historic scene came to be. So ter- so Travolta basically took control of the dance sequence, which he should because he's such a great dancer. Yeah. And such a natural on a stage like that. And what really makes that scene special is the eye contact between Mia and Vincent. You know, they never they never drop eye contact with one another as they're dancing. In I it. think there are a few moments of... Maybe. Me, okay, there yeah. are a few. But, like, yeah. but they... Like they, when Mia's doing the... Okay, hey, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> but they maintain... Very heavy eye, t- eye contact. And it's yeah. very intense, and you can feel the connection between them. I love when the camera gets in there in their faces, yeah. too. It's really It's kind of like them being intimate in, in, in a way. their way without getting in trouble. Now, I do remember Marcel Swallows, my husband, your boss, told me that you have to do whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> the milkshake is great, too. I want to try yeah. this milkshake, this $5 milkshake. Sounds, it makes my, so not, this movie makes me thirsty between the Sprite and Hungry for a Burger. Sprite's good. <laughs> What's in the Sprite? Sprite's good. Do you mind if I have a sip of mind your... Mind if I wash down this tasty beverage? With your tasty beverage? It <laughs> uh, makes me so thirsty. And then the milkshake is like... I, I always like want a milkshake after watching this. Now, when Mia orders her milkshake, Buddy Holly, the waiter played by Steve Buscemi, asks her if she wants it Martin and Lewis or Amos and Andy. Do you know what that's referring to? Vanilla or chocolate. Exactly. So it's referring to both comedy duos... Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, two white men, or the Amos and Andy show, two black men, basically asking if she wants a vanilla shake or a chocolate shake. That's what that that's what that reference is. There's a really cool thing about Vincent. It's never said between Vincent and Butch. Vincent and Butch have like a rivalry, you know? Because so first of all, and I'm sorry to sidetrack for Mia, but it, it, oh, it's I all just good, thought dude. of it. So in the in the strip club bar when uh, Vincent is standing at the bar after Jules walks away, and then Butch comes up and orders a pack of cigarettes. They have this like standoff with one another, and <clears throat> Vincent says, "Vincent calls him a word. He calls him Palooka, 
Yeah, the Paluga, yeah. And then Butch is like, what'd you say? And he goes, I think you heard me, Punchy. So Paluka is a derogatory term of bo- towards boxers. It's like a very old term, but it's, it's spoken in a derogative. Uh, and then Punchy is also another derogatory term to call a, po- a boxer as well. as someone who's like been punched up too much and they're getting dim-witted because they've been hit so many times. So Paluka also means someone who throws fights or is a bad fighter. Yeah, so it's, Paluka means a bad fighter as well. That's what he's referring to. So he insults Butch multiple times. And when I was a kid, I had no idea what that word meant. I was like, what did he just say? But that's what he say. He says Paluka. And so he's insulting Butch the whole time. That's the reason why Vincent's car got keyed. I That's think. what I believe too. Because when he goes to to his drug dealer to Lance, and he's like, "Man, I had my car in storage for three days, for three the for three years. It's been out for five days. Some fucker keyed my car. Like, what kind of what kind of spine, spineless scumbag does that? It was definitely Butch keying his car after he insulted him. Definitely because yeah. it happened a couple of days ago. He was at the bar a couple of days ago, delivering the briefcase. Had that altercation. Butch probably saw his car and keyed it. So it's de- I guarantee Butch is the one who keyed his car. I agree, hundred percent. Yeah, and, and we didn't even get to the to the adrenaline shot and the heroin overdose. I mean, Uma Thurman plays the OD so well. It's like when I watch it every time, it's like she looks like she's really ODing. She's such a great physical performer, and we saw that part of her talent obviously so much in Kill Bill. But she has a great control of her body, and uh, uh, it's terrifying and. That drive when he's driving through uh, L.A. and and Mia's ODing in her in her in the passenger seat and he calls Lance and Lance like will pick up he's just watching TV and cereal and you're like you're like pick up the phone <laughs> pick it up and he crashes into the front of his house and then they get into that fight but uh, the adrenaline shot scene it's just like the pawn shop sequence it's something that happens it's like so unpredictable it's an, a brilliant story direction for this chapter. And he does an amazing job of building suspense, of conflict, of panic, of give me a goddamn felt pen, a felt pen, a magic marker. <laughs> you got it. What are you looking for? What are you looking for? That's the that's little, one of the biggest quotes of our life. We say that all the time. What are you looking for? A little black medical book. A what? A what are you looking for? <laughs> <laughs> what are you looking for? <laughs> and I love the sequence because there's that other girl on the couch just with a bong in her hand. And she's like so high. She's like slowly realizing what's happening. And she's just like in the background in the corner of the frame. But it's so her funny. Her head's just like turning She's like, what right? is happening? <laughs> it's so funny. And then, but the the biggest moment of suspense in the entire film has got to be when the shot's in Travolta's hand and Vincent's hand. And everyone's watching. And he cuts, he and Sally Menke, they cut to a close-up of, each person, and then the the little dot on Uma Thurman's chest, and Jody's that, smiling. <laughs> yeah, and he and they, he does a, a push, like a zoom in of each character, just building that suspense, just building it, and then he finally cuts to the shot, and then she jumps up, screaming with the uh, the shot in her chest, and say something, something. It's just amazing. I remember seeing it as a kid, like, what the fuck? This is crazy. It's all from editing, too. Yeah. Excellent Great editing, editing, because this is a scene that I'm sure was tricky. On paper, it's cool as hell, and like, oh yeah, we can totally do this, but then like, when you're actually gonna film this, like, how are you actually gonna film this scene and make it look believable and realistic? And we've talked about it before, how they filmed it in reverse. The stab. Well, they, yeah, they, they filmed the reverse, and the, the stab in reverse, and then they just put it forwards, and they reverse the footage to make it seem like he's punching down. Yeah. I, got, I got stabbed her three times? <laughs> no, stab her once. <laughs> stab her three times? <laughs> you come down in a stabbing motion. You got a breastplate. You got to get through that. But also just the cuts, the brilliant cuts, like you said, the close-ups to the shot where it's just stripping down to each character, the felt marker pen on her chest. But instead of showing like a grotesque shot of the sh- like the plunge in the needle going into her chest, it's just a cut to... The the syringe it's a going great, down, great sound effect. Syringe great going down, thud. that thud, and then Uma popping up, that's Mila all you need. jumping up. That's all you need. It's just great editing. It's not overthinking it. It's just simple stuff that works so well. That's what I meant earlier about the production of this. It's very low budget. It's not the greatest techniques you've ever seen in your life, but it's done so well and it's done so effectively that clearly Tarantino is a master filmmaker, even at this point, working with... He understood. He had $3 million yeah. to work with after paying all the actors. I got to make this two-hour and 40-minute and movie work with all these crazy scenes. I'm going to do it effectively and efficiently 
and it still fits. It works. It still looks better than half the stuff you see today. Yeah, and the, his ability to throw in to make something terrifying and funny at the same time when he does the close-ups of Lance and Travolta, and they're just like, "Oh fuck!" And then he cuts to uh, Rosanna Arquette. Patricia Arquette, and she's just like smiling. Rosanna. Rosanna. It's just, it's such a funny it, shot. It makes it more of a comical situation yeah. versus like something that could have been really grotesque or, or terrifying. And that you're right. That was a, a very important scene. And so Tarantino, he was either actually going to play Lance or Jimmy. And he, he actually had a bunch of actors in mind for Jimmy, but nobody was available for the shooting day. So he ended up picking Jimmy. But he was, he was going to pick either. Jimmy or Lance, and Eric Stoltz was going to play the opposite. Then he decided to play Jimmy because he thought that the adrenaline shot scene would require really his, his full attention as a director, whereas the Jimmy scene, I mean, as a director, not so much. It's very simple filmmaking, that entire sequence, but the adrenaline shot required a lot of finesse and artistry and really understanding the craft of filmmaking, cinematography, and editing to really pull it off the right way. So he decided, Eric Stoltz, you can play Lance, and I'm just going to be the direct focus on directing that entire sequence. So he made the right choice, obviously. And back to Jimmy, and this is probably something controversial that we should definitely talk about. And it's the use of the N word in this film, which has been which it gets used by pretty much it's Marcellus, Jules, Winfield, and Jimmy, as well as I think there's a few other N bombs in this movie as Zed. well. Zed says Zed it. says it a few times. Yeah. So in Maynard as well. Yeah. Now, Tarantino, we've talked about this before, and specifically in the director's spotlight. You know, from our perspective, Tarantino's goal as a storyteller is to tell realistic and authentic stories with realistic and authentic characters. And these are horrible people. They're killers. The characters in this movie are rapists, serial killers, kidnappers, murderers, robbers. These are not people you want to be friends with. They're not people that you want to know or interact with. They are terrible human beings, every single one of them. Even like even Jimmy, we don't see him doing any terrible anything terrible. But you without, know, without question, he's like, yeah, you can bring a dead body into my house and dispose of it, no problem. They're yeah. gangsters. Yeah. They're very bad people. So obviously, they're gonna say bad things. They're gonna say the n word, especially you know, this movie's made in 1994. Takes place probably in like what like the 1980s. It probably takes place in the early 90s, maybe. So it was a different time. I think people were throwing this word around more loosely than obviously now. This Which is not good, obviously. Not good at all, yeah. but the N-word was definitely used more loosely before the 21st century. Absolutely, especially before the 1990s and going in in, in the 1990s. So, and, and also, there's a lot of derogatory slurs towards Asians as well in this film. Yeah, and women. There's, yeah, and women. There's a bunch. This so is a, a ton of them. He's not promoting this language. He's just telling authentic character stories and, uh, and real dialogue that these horrible people would say. You know, we're in this world where even terrible killers in movies have to say correct things, which is odd. You understand why culture is shifting like that, especially in, in the internet phase, in the social media phase right now. But these are horrible people, and people are bad. They do bad things. Some of these people are killers. Killers are not politically correct. Killers say just as horrible things as the acts they take out on other human beings. Yeah. So obviously they're going to say terrible, horrific, racist, evil things because they do terrible, horrific, evil things. It's just authentic to a, a character. He's not promoting it. I don't think Tarantino is a racist writer or director. I think it's just what he's trying to do as a storyteller. Yeah, he's just trying to be authentic authentic to these CD terrible people that he's writing into his stories that's I, I, I that's where I look at it is but also I mean obviously we don't condone it at all and it is definitely something that is worth being discussed for I mean sure. if Tarantino was a racist person he wouldn't have so many prominent black actors and black characters in his movies also in like the most powerful positions as well. Marcellus I mean, Wallace and, and Jules are the most powerful characters in the movie. Jackie Brown, yeah. Pam Greer. I mean, I mean, Sam L. Jackson's been in every one of his movies pretty much except for one or two of them. So I, I think if if he was a racist person, he wouldn't love black cinema, black culture, and put it in his movies. I have a fun fact about Sam Jackson, actually. It's, I love it's, Sam it's Jackson a theory guys. that uh, since he says he's going to walk the earth like Kane from Kung Fu and go from place to place and get into adventures... In Kill Bill, he plays the wayward piano player. 
Oh yeah, in the and, uh, chapel. And so it's implied that like he he could be Jules. Like he's been drifting, and now he's like this drifting piano player playing pian- playing cool. piano in this little church never thought about in the middle that. of nowhere. I it never, could be Jules. Never thought about that. <laughs> it's pretty fun to like when you connect Tarantino stories like that because there's a lot of ways to connect them. Did you know that Fabian is who's played by Maria de Medeiros? She is Portuguese French, French Portuguese. So she's born in Portugal, but she's fluent in sprint, in French. I believe one of her parents was French. She's fluent in Spanish and French, and I'm pretty sure she's also fluent in English. She acts also in Italian as well. Wow. But the character Fabian is just French and doesn't speak Spanish because Butch is teaching her terrible Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Don't need esta la zapateria. Where zapateria. is the shoe store? <laughs> That's such a random thing to learn. There's also a really cool fact about Marvin's death. So according to Phil Lamar, and he gave this interview recently, it was John Travolta who came up with the idea of Marvin being shot in the face. Marvin was originally supposed to be accidentally shot in the throat and then die a slow, painful death. Vincent and Jules would then decide that Marvin should be shot in the head and put out of his misery. Knowing that this would make the characters unlikable, Travolta took his idea to Quentin Tarantino and he agreed to it, figuring that a single bullet kill would be funnier. Legend has it that Lamar was the one who came up with the idea, but Lamar denies this in his appearance on the I Was There 2 podcast. So that's a pretty fun anecdote. That And John Travolta also had a lot of input about his character design with the long hair, and with the bullet tie and with constantly smoking cigarettes, Tarantino wanted him to just have like his normal Travolta appearance. But Travolta was like, "Give me, the, I want to have the long hair and the bolo tie." So he's those were instrumental things that I think Tarantino nowadays would be a little more controlling about character design and improvisation. But back then, you know, he's still up and coming. I think he was open to great ideas from someone he respected. Yeah, and obviously Sam L growing out the mutton chops because Sam L's always been an actor who's really in tune with how his character looks and always wants to have a specific aesthetic to whatever character he's playing. You can see that in pretty much all of the major roles he's had. And obviously I think maybe the most iconic thing is probably Star Wars where he told George Lucas or asked George Lucas, can I have a purple lightsaber? And George Lucas is like, well, should I have blue or green? He's like... Yeah, but can I have a purple one? He's like, I'm Sam Jackson, bitch. All right, you can have a purple lightsaber. I'm a bad mother. It also it also yeah. said BMF on it. <laughs> yeah, so I, I love that about Sam L, how, how he just loves to play with the look of his characters. It just adds so much to his performance, and obviously he just takes his job so seriously, which is what you want from great actors like him as well. Great details. Oh, absolutely, man. And Jules, just stay on him for, for a little bit is... Like you said, he's always usually been my favorite character. It's usually between Vincent or Jules. But then the last couple of times I've watched it, I've just grown more towards Butch because of the things I talked about earlier. But Jules, like you said, is just got the best dialogue, chewy dialogue. Like any actor would love to play this role. The things he's saying, so philosophical, so articulate, well-spoken. Everything he says, it sounds like he's a, like an actor or a news anchor. It's so It's so well-spoken. And... I love how he has a change on his perspective of life later on and how he flips his Ezekiel quote on its head and reinterprets it after the divine intervention where now he's saving lives and buying lives, which is interesting because maybe he's now getting maybe a God complex where he's buying where he's buying pumpkin and honey bunnies lives with that money where he's like, take the money. You know, I'm buying, I'm buying your lives because otherwise you guys would be di- dead as fried chicken. But right now you're going to be saved because I'm buying your life. I'm purchasing it. I wouldn't say that. I would say that he's living the righteous path now. Yeah, in a way. And that's the righteous thing to do. But also it's it's smart because he recognizes, he says there's a, he mentions a few different interpretations of the of the Bible verse. And then he comes to the realization, but we both know that that ain't the truth. He, and he says, the truth is you're the weak and I am the tyranny of, wick- of wicked men. So he accepts he, who he is. He understands that he's an evil person, and he takes advantage and preys upon the weak. And he understands that he's been a villain all his life, and so now, now he's turning over a new leaf and trying to live a righteous path. I think he understands that he's just a gun in the hands of a more powerful evil person, Marcellus Wallace, or whoever he's worked for in the past. That, I mean, that's why I love that monologue. It's very deep, but also... Man, what a great what a great performance by Sam Jackson. It's um, it's really remarkable what he does. He's one of those actors where it's like, how does he not have an Oscar? It's crazy. It is. I I think he should have won for Hateful Eight. 
and also should have won supporting for Django Unchained. The Hateful Eight, Samuel Jackson, that might be the most underappreciated performance in this century, possibly. I, I love that movie. It's really hit or miss with people, and I know a lot of people that really don't like it, but it's really remarkable what the cast did and what the, how incredible the script is. But Sam L is so sensational in that movie. But for me, he really disappears in Django. He like the physicality of that performance, the voice change, the weak facade he's putting on, the shaking hand. He's it's the most chameleon he's ever it's done. It's the most for he's role. disappeared for sure. I that's what, I think he should have won an Oscar for Django. I think Jane. the Academy would not give. Honestly, Oscar Django kind of should have had two Oscars for supporting actors for Le- that year. Yes, yeah, so it should have been Leo and him, yeah. I saw this interview where <laughs> someone... you can only give one. Yeah, <laughs> I saw this interview recently. He was promoting something last year, and the interviewer asked him, like, why why aren't you... What do you think you don't get nominated for enough, enough Oscars? And he's like, well, I mean, Django and Chain, he's like, I should have been nominated. Leo should have been nominated. I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't understand why we didn't get nominated. I think people know why. Yeah, I mean, it's... I just think the Academy doesn't really like Tarantino. It's... Well, it's the kind of characters... Yeah, that's those true. two characters, they would I don't think they would want to be nominated for a role because of Calvin Candy being a slaver and the kind of character that Samuel Jackson plays in that film as well. Oh yeah, that's a good point. That's definitely a good so point. So I think the Academy like we talked about why they don't nominate people in horror films or really that often in science fiction and even comedy, because they think it'll like affect or dilute the prestige of the award. Yeah, I suppose so. But it's just kinda of silly to think that he only has two Oscars as a writer. <laughs> It's nuts. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I always I like to say it's like Michael Jordan should have won. The, he could have won the MVP every year he played in his prime instead of just winning, I think, three MVPs or four MVPs. They could, I think because they're like, we got to give it to someone else. Terrence, well, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but the fact that Up in the Air beat him for Inglorious Bastards is sh- That's just shocking. for the Globe. This is just for the Globe. No, man. the Oscar. No, Up in the Air was an adapted. Who won the Oscar that year for a screenplay? Um, I'm not sure, but what? It was, no, but he he won over the he won in the Globe. Okay, the da- once in the air was well, up in the air is based on a book. Inglorious is obviously an original script. So Tarantino won Oscars for Pulp Django Fiction, Django Chain and Pulp, and Pulp. No, yeah, Django and Chain and Pulp Fiction. Yeah, Django screenplay. What won for the year Inglorious Bastards came out? He wasn't so even 2000, nominated. So 2009. Wait, what? Wait, wait, hold on. All right, so he, he had was, to have been nominated. He was nominated for. Okay, so he won. Django, he won Best Original Screenplay. Yeah. Nominated for Best Original Screenplay, but lost to... Hold on, let me pull it up. You talk about something else. There's something about Tarantino and his movies that you get to see in this film. What I really like is he likes to show people moving from space to space. And it can be boring. And it's ironic because you always learn... You're always taught in screenwriting from screenwriting experts or what have you. I'm using that with quotation marks. Like, n- n- always, you're in an, in the scene as late as possible, and you, lo- you leave as soon as possible. Like, take up as little time in the scene as possible. You're not supposed to show someone walking into a room. You're not supposed to show someone walking down a hallway. Tarantino does it. Like, why can't anyone else do it? Like, he'll show two characters walking through the hallway at the boxing arena to get into the locker room. You know, he likes to watch people move from space to space. We see it in his latter films, with the overhead shots, lots of great long takes of people moving through room to room. But I like how, and the the opening of the film is just two people walking into a space. I like how he'll he'll show that he 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 shows Mia and Vincent pulling up to the Jackrabbit Slim's restaurant, walking into the restaurant, and sitting down at the table. Every other movie would just cut to them at the table. You know what I mean? But he likes to show that. And I like that. It makes it feel like the space is real. It makes it feel like this is a real moment that's actually happening. I think that he understands that, you know, he's trying to make it as relatable to the audience as possible. And watching someone walk into a room makes it feel like it's happening rather than let's just cut to them in the diner. It wouldn't feel the same. You, if, imagine if that scene started with them talking at the table. It wouldn't have the same tone at all. Quentin Tarantino in Inglorious Bastards lost Best Original Screenplay to... Mark Bull for The Hurt Locker. Oh, it was The Hurt Locker year. Hurt Locker won Best Screenplay, Best Director, and Best Picture. So, screenplay, I feel like, should have gone to Inglorious Bastards. The Hurt Locker screenplay, it was good, but I mean... Inglorious Bastards is a, kind of a different level, in It was just opinion. at the... It, was, it came out at the right time, is what it was. Yeah, I love The Hurt Locker, dude. Yeah, I mean, I love, I, I'm, I'm happy it won Best I'm Picture. I'm fine with Best Picture and Best Director, but yeah. Best Screenplay, I feel like that's got to go to Tarantino with the Absolutely. Bastards. Absolutely. Just because of that opening scene. And then the, the diner, I mean, the bar scene, the pub. Those two scenes are better than the entirety of Hurt Locker, honestly. That's shocking. 
That's crazy. Honestly, in my opinion, uh, Inglorious Bastards should have won Best Picture, Best Director, um, Best Supporting Actor, which it did with Christoph Waltz, and Best Screenplay, and probably Best Cinematography as well. Best Production Design Best as well. Best Editing. <laughs> Just every award. It honestly should have cleaned up at the Oscars. That's my, th- I think. Yeah. It's a debatable. I still think the the Hurt Locker is just really well made. I, I, oh, I like so an expertly crafted film in Catherine Bigelow really knocked it out of the park with that one. She was firing on all cylinders in that. <laughs> Jeremy movie. Renner, we we're praying for him. That was a he, that was a really big movie. That really was. I think I think that's one of my favorite war movies. Even though it's not, it actually wasn't a big movie. It's the lowest grossing uh, best picture winner ever. Well, critically, it was a big movie. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was great. <laughs> I think it's terrific. <laughs> Sorry, man. I Even though it's that. not an accurate, super accurate war film, which a lot of it's not, veterans yeah, have told it's us. It's not, yeah. But it's still, it's a movie. It's a movie. All right. What else can we talk about? I have. I made a list of my favorite lines. I would love to hear the list, bro. All right. I'll, I'll try to do impersonations of each character. My best. All right. Don't you just love it when you come back from the bathroom and find your food waiting for you? Hell yeah. Mia Wallace. We've all said that. Yeah. And, uh. Does Marcellus Wallace look like a bitch? <laughs> <laughs> what does he look like? Then why are you trying to fuck him like a bitch? <laughs> yes, you did. Yes, you did. <laughs> Say one again. Say one again. I dare you. I double dare you, motherfucker. Say what one more goddamn time. <laughs> and then we said earlier, what, I got to stab her three times? <laughs> she out in a stabbing motion. That's <laughs> so funny. <laughs> English motherfucker, do you speak it? <laughs> so that quote I love, it turned into a great meme. So Amy Adams in Arrival. <laughs> so I posted this on our Instagram. So it's a shot of Amy Adams in Arrival holding up the big whiteboard. <laughs> and in the film, she's she has the symbols written. Human. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's actual uh, writing. Yes, it's human. Yeah, human uh, English. And then someone in superimposed, English motherfucker, do you speak it? <laughs> and Amy Adams, like, confused face. She's, like, holding it, like, worried. And it says, English motherfucker, do you speak it? <laughs> did you post it recently? <laughs> That's my favorite meme did ever. You, did you post it recently? <laughs> I posted it, like, uh, maybe three or four months uh, ago. I it's posted so a great, fucking good. I posted a great oh meme God. today for Pulp Fiction, which would I posted it on uh, Saturday. It's the top shot. It's two shots from Lord of the Rings. It's the top. It's Elrond saying, cast it into the fire. Destroy it. <laughs> and the bomb shot, Sam L has been superimposed onto <laughs> Isil Dor. And he says, I don't remember asking you a goddamn thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's so fucking funny. Oh, my God. Oh, man. <laughs> and then Vincent saying, that's a pretty fucking good milkshake. I don't know if it's worth five dollars, but it's pretty fucking pretty good. Pretty fucking good. It's pretty fucking good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Did I break your concentration? <laughs> hey, flock of seagulls. <laughs> We're all gonna be like three little Fonzies here. What's Fonzie, Yolanda? Cool. Cool. <laughs> Fonzie's cool. <laughs> and then uh, Pumpkin says to him, "Which wallet is it? It's the one that says bad motherfucker." <laughs> <laughs> Pretty please with sugar on top. Clean the fucking car. <laughs> the wolf. <laughs> if I'm cart, because it's because time is of the essence. I talk fast, I speak fast, something like that. We should add shotguns. <laughs> up the four guys up there. Should then, add uh, shotguns. Uh, Vincent, do you want to continue this theological discussion in the car or in the jailhouse with the cops? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love this one. Now, if you excuse me. I'm going to go home and have a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> I want to dance. I want to win. I want that trophy. So dance good. I love when he's like, <laughs> like Vincent's going to be a dead man if, yeah, yeah, if uh, yeah. Marcellus finds out. And and she's like, I'll be in as much trouble with Marcellus as you. He's like, I seriously <laughs> doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So funny. This, it's, this movie really is just hysterical. Honestly, like, I crack up. Still, after like seeing it over man. 30 times, it's still funny. It's just one of those movies that you, you got to watch annually. And every oh, year. Oh, absolutely. It's just like watching it. It's like an old friend hanging out with them, shooting the shit. It's just such a wonderful experience. And like I said, I haven't seen it, I want to say, in maybe two years, maybe two and a half. And what what a wonderful I could tell. time. I could yeah, tell. wonderful wonderful time I had. I was just like giddy as soon as it started. I was like... Hands on my knee, elbows on my knees, hands on my chin, like oh man, enjoying the hell out of this wide-eyed. I just had so much fun watching it. Yeah, it's a special movie, and 
there really is nothing like it, even in his filmography, but just in general, there's nothing like Pulp Fiction. It's actually a really great Stanley Kubrick interview. I saw, not of Kubrick, but of his co-writer on Eyes Wide Shut, and the guy said that um, one day Kubrick called him up, and he's like, have you seen Pulp Fiction? And the guy was like, yeah, I saw it. He's like, well, and then Kubrick goes, well, we need, to, we need to, like, consider this. You know, we need to consider this as we're making this one. Like, this is out there. So even Kubrick was, like, so impressed where he felt like, you know, this is something to really think about as directors, that this movie exists now. Well, he's probably alluding to the fact that this is going to change movies. Yeah, it's going to yeah. change storytelling forever, which obviously Stanley Kubrick did as well. But, you know, we're, that's what Pulp Fiction did in the 90s is it's still relevant today. It changed the trajectory of movies. It created its own subgenre in the gangster genre, in the crime genre. It's been replicated and tried to ripped be off. ripped off yeah. so many times. And, you know, every in the 90s, it was just plagued with these crime movies. Crime where, movies where, in the 90s. Where the gangsters were just talking about, like, I love Lucy in the car. It's like, yeah, because you're trying to make the next Pulp Fiction or you're influenced by it, but... The influence of Pulp Fiction is immense. It's one of the most important movies ever made. And I think it's rightfully shown with the IMDb user rating that fans and audiences love it so much. It's it's so it's such a, a beloved film in, in the history of cinema. But I think it's silly that Tarantino wants to stop at ten movies. Cause like, does that mean he thinks that like he can't top Death Proof or Jackie Brown? No, no, no. It's not. I don't think it's that. I think it's because he believes he'll lose his connection with being relevant with audiences. No, no, no. He he says it's because he doesn't want to be remembered as a director who lost his his magic. Well, I've I've seen interviews both times. He says different things a lot. I think. Well, I've seen a bunch where he says he doesn't want to be like other filmmakers who he loves who whose latter films were nothing compared to his their primes. Yeah, so maybe he's. I think he's afraid to lose touch with people and touch with audiences. I mean, I but I also know. think that maybe he's finding loopholes by potentially doing these miniseries and stuff. Not like potentially, that. he's doing it. It's so not, it's so, official. So I think he's finding loopholes and still being able to Man, make movies. And, yeah, and shows. Man, I don't know. I still think that he's gonna be like. 80 years old and be like, oh, I have a fucking awesome idea for a movie, <laughs> and he's going to do it. But, I mean, what if what if he still hasn't even come up with his idea for his 10th film? He probably has an idea. What if what if he hasn't yet? Maybe. I'm sure he's got a million ideas, but maybe he hasn't found it yet, and that's why he's taking his time. Take his sweet old time. I mean, he's there's been years— Well, I mean, it, once upon a time, it just came out. I mean, and, but there's also been droughts in his career where he just takes a lot of time between his films. Yeah, before Jackie Brown and Kill Bill was um, five years, four years, something like that. that because the Glorious Bastards came out 2009. But what he made, um, Death Proof in 2007. Yeah. After Kill so Bill. I mean, he's taking breaks here and there, but it's because he's probably he's not like to... Nolan. Every two years, a movie. Comes I don't know out. how the guy does it, dude. It's because he doesn't have a phone. Yeah, true. I he mean, has zero I don't distractions. Tar yeah, but Tarantino probably doesn't use a he phone. He has a flip right? phone. Yeah, so he barely yeah. uses it. But I mean, Chris Nolan's just. That work ethic is insane. He doesn't even have a phone. It's crazy. He doesn't even have a, a, a phone at all. <laughs> Every two years, he puts out a massive movie with yeah. a crazy, unique script. It's pretty. It's pretty interesting to see how uh, how in tune he is with like every two years. It's something, and he only got slowed down because of the lockdown. Yeah, with Oppenheimer. I mean, T Tenet even came out though in 2020. So it came yeah, but like the production between Oppenheimer's release, it would have came out in 2022. Yeah, exactly. He probably is like obsessed with like the. He's number like, God damn it! <laughs> He's like, I only like variables of two. What the fuck? <laughs> Three years. God fucking damn it, motherfucker! I have to put out a year a movie in 2024 now. I'm super fly TNT. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I touch brain, I'm a mushroom kind of lame, lame motherfucker, motherfucker. Ironically, I'm gonna make Oppenheimer. It's fucking nuts. <laughs> Um, Tarantino is, you know, one of the greatest voices in cinema history, one of the best filmmakers of all time, a true auteur, possibly the, the greatest writer, probably the best writer director of all time. It's arguable. I mean, he's only made one script based off a novel. Everything else has been completely original. Yeah. So, um, when you look at sc screenwriters, the only one that you can really compare to him is Aaron Sorkin in terms of dialogue. Aaron Sorkin is a master of writing dialogue. But what really separates them is that Aaron Sorkin writes material based off of pre-existing uh, stories, except for The West Wing, which is, I mean, obviously based on... The White House. Yeah, The yeah, White House. Based on politics. But his, his movies, his movie scripts are all based on real stories. So he's basically retelling stories. In Money his own, Ball. Yeah. Social Network. Trial uh, of the Chicago. Molly's Game. Chicago 7. He makes adaptations of pre-existing stories. 
the thing with Tarantino movies, except for Jackie Brown, is they're his stories. They didn't they weren't they didn't exist before he made them, before he wrote them. There's something special about that. And Aaron Sorkin, you could argue Aaron Sorkin might be a better writer of dialogue, but that being said, he's not inventing characters. He's not inventing stories exactly. So that's that's what really makes Tarantino uh, special and sets him apart from like the other best screenwriter living right now. Not to mention just the uniqueness of his characters and, and mm-hmm. uniqueness of his stories are just on a different. Not level. a knock on Aaron Sorkin. I mean, oh, he's he terrific. really is. He's, uh, in my opinion, the second best screenwriter in film. It's it's shocking what he does, Tarantino, and both of them. But I mean, what Tarantino does in terms of like being the writer director, it's 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 phenomenal. Love the guy, love his movies. He's he might be our most watched director. It's like between him and it's Nolan there, and Scorsese. It's up there, yeah, probably those three, and then yeah. like Kubrick. But I mean, we grew up on the Kill Bill movies. Yeah, we really did. Those we, were our favorite we, movies for years. We loved those movies. I still remember seeing them in theaters. Those are the the first Tarantino's movies we saw in movies. The thing with Tarantino's movies is like I've seen them so many times I can like replay them in my head, yeah. like scene for scene. Like I like I, I know them so well. I didn't even have to watch Pulp Fiction again, but I just did it because I, I wanted was like, to. Yeah, I was so like, yeah, fun. let's watch it. Yeah, fuck it, fuck it, it. fuck it. It's <laughs> my new favorite quote. It's, it's, new point, it's Johnny Utah on Point Break before he jumps out the plane with no parachute. Fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's funny. All right, that wraps our two hour and almost three hour episode on Pulp Fiction. This is one we've been saving for a while because. We wanted to wait until we had a good following and just save that bacon in the freezer for a while. Sick reference. <laughs> Let me know if you know where it's from. And we're, we're so happy to finally tackle this. We dabbled in it with our Tarantino spotlights. And we talked about it here and there, depending on like if we were talking about uh, Travolta or Bruce Willis spotlight. We brought it up a few times. To finally approach and analyze Pulp Fiction was a delight. Something that I've been looking forward to for the last two and a half years and it was well worth the wait, and I really hope you all enjoyed this episode because it was such a blast to just talk about this with you, man. Yeah, likewise, man. I had a great time. I hope you did too, everyone. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Become a patron today at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Take care, everyone. See you next time, motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> This episode of Raiders of the Lost Podcast was executive produced by our chosen one patrons, Luke Exelston, Tyler McFly, Darren Singleton, Anthony DeMeo, John A. Graz, Becca Keen, Cody Moen, Benjamin Cook, Calvin Cam. Raiders of the Lost Podcast is a Mirror Image production. Sound mixing done by Jacob Kosler. Opening music by Chase Jackson.